Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And welcome to our March, March 9th meeting. I'd like to advise the public that prior to this meeting, the board met in executive session to discuss a real estate issue. Mr. Burma, would you please call the roll? Mr. D'Amelio. Here. Mr. Oliva. Here. Mr. McCluskey. Here. Mr. Siegel. Here. Mr. Lewis. Here. Mr. Quinn. Here. Dr. Hart. Here. Mr. Holmes. Here. Wexler. Here. Please all rise and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance with our Chief of Police. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, There you go. The <laughs> first item is our township. Uh, Mr. President, uh, Mr. Anderson uh, said that he was not going to be able to make it tonight, but he did review the expenditures and warrants for this month's meeting and found no irregularities. He didn't pass on any sports information or jokes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Very good. Our next item, which is not on the written agenda, is an update from our Environmental Advisory Committee, Mr. Peter Puglianisi, on an ordinance that has to do with plastic bags and restriction. But thank you for coming. Thank you. Uh, we should hopefully have a presentation. Yes, it is up there. See it. Okay. Well, it'll be up there uh, shortly. Can we put it up there, too? All right. Uh, I want to go quickly through this. We had a limited amount of time. Um, thank you to uh, Commissioner D'Amelio for requesting this evaluation from um, EAC. So our charge was, uh, should we do something about single-use plastic bags and straws? If so, what? Um, and so, um, a few of the members of EAC did uh, some research. Um, Jim Stevens and Amy Colleen notably, uh, and everyone was involved in reviewing. The first few slides, now you have the presentation. I'm not going to talk about it at length, but the why. Why are we doing this, OK? Um, you've seen it. You've heard it. Uh, documentaries. Uh, the, there's ample studies by uh, the federal government and state governments on the effect on marine life. So that's, that's a major consideration. Um, so some of these, uh, I'm not going to go into details. We knew about this probably uh, five, ten years ago. What we have learned, I think, uh, which is even more troubling in the last few years is we have what's been called microplastics due to degradation, partial degradation in the environment to uh, very small and even microscopic size uh, particles of plastic that are now in the food chain. Uh, so to the point that it's not just marine mammals that are ingesting microplastics, we know it, it is also us. Um, so. This is the, the, the tale of it. I, did, I just wanted to mention, um, well, can't we recycle all the plastic bags? Well, yes, can, but do we? Okay, we don't. We have the ability, all the stores have places to bring back plastic bags. The amount of recycling is minimal. Um, and even more important, the question is, what's getting out in the environment, okay? So even if we could increase the recycling rate to 50%, what does that do for the problem of plastics in the environment? Probably not much. So single-use plastic bags, SUPG for short, you're gonna see it in some of these slides. Um, what's the problem we talked about uh, what, are we, what are the examples of local ordinances and state ordinances? What is effective and what's not effective? What's our recommendation? Uh, the goal of all of this is to reduce our contribution to plastics pollution uh, in the environment, also 
you know, trash in our local environment. Obviously, all of you who are out there fishing, maybe doing stream cleanups, keeping your eyes open out on the street, you see it all over, right? It's, we're, we're not capturing it 100% in the trash. It's out there in our community. It's out there. Every time it rains, it's, it's getting washed into the stream. So definitions, which are in uh, the proposed ordinance, uh, single use, reusable, and a fee, obviously. We'll talk about why. Plastic facts, I'm gonna, you know, you guys can read this. There's a lot. Um, you also know plastics do not biodegrade by and large. Uh, they do degrade, photodegrade in UV light if they're out in the sunlight they will photodegrade, but not completely. So this is, I think, how a lot of the microplastics form. So you get uh, certain bonds of the plastic breaking apart, and you get smaller and smaller pieces of plastic. Um, you've heard about compostable biodegradables, um, and I'll wrap back around on, uh, to this on, at the end. Right now, they are not a solution for us. Um, all right, so I'm going to skip this slide. There's a lot, there's a lot of affected species, a lot of plastic in the environment. 80% of seabirds have plastic in their stomachs. It's, um, it's pretty pervasive. Facts, there are links to all of these. I'm not going to go over all of these. So what do we do about it? Um, States have acted already. I think there's eight states or seven plus the District of Columbia that have acted. I was in California about a year ago on a business trip and I was surprised, oh, I can't get a plastic bag at a Walmart. <laughs> so we're not necessarily now on the leading edge. This has been done, I think it's been a, a couple of years in California. So a state of 50 million people have done it. Hawaii has done it. Countries have done it now. So this is not rocket science. It's, uh, it's been tried. So the interesting thing is, as you know, in Pennsylvania, there was an attempt to ban the bans, restrict local discretion. And more states have restricted local discretion than have bag bans. Okay, so be aware of that. That's why is that? Because of the influence of industry and maybe to a certain extent a legitimate desire to say, well, we shouldn't have a patchwork of ordinances and regulations. And I agree, we should have a statewide <laughs> ban and fee policy, but in the absence of that, what do we do, what can we do? And one of the messages that you can send, which I think is what, what Steve's interest is, <clears throat> is if locales do it, the state legislator, legislature gets the message that they should be moving on this. So examples, Connecticut, Delaware, California is the biggest. <clears throat> um, Municipal, so locally, and you've read about this, Narberth did it in 2018. Uh, Westchester enacted a ban and fee. So, and I'll go over, you know, f what are the flavors? Uh, Narberth did just a fee. Westchester did a ban and fee. Philadelphia, uh, that's not accurate. They went back and forth. I guess when this was written, they were gonna do a 15 cent fee, and now they have just a ban. Okay, and we'll talk about good, bad, and different. Uh, other large cities have done it. Um, there is a excellent, there's some, some of these links have excellent compendiums of um, the laws that are out there and uh, what the advantages and disadvantages are. So Pennsylvania, uh, there was legislation to put a, a, a local preemptive preemption permanently in place, which was vetoed in 2019, it was stuck into the budget bill, a one-year moratorium on local ordinances on bags. So July 1st, it ends. I have not heard anything. I've done some research myself. 
the, the premise was the legislature is going to study it for a year. I've heard zero. Um, and I, I'm not sure uh, if anything is going on with that. All right, what flavor should you enact? There's three basic approaches, uh, a ban, a fee on all bags, and a ban fee hybrid. And basically the ban fee, fee hybrid is what we recommend and is most widely recommended. It's what California does. Um, so um, studies have been done on the various um, options. The ban only, why not just ban it? Well, what happens is you shift almost 100% to paper, okay? And the objective is not necessarily just to shift from plastic to paper, but to get reusable bags, okay? Why? Because there's a lot of environmental impact of making single-use paper bags as well. So that's why what's recommended is a ban and a fee together so the fee encourages you to reuse the bags. Um, let's see. You might read, uh, oh, we enacted a ban, we studied it, and now people are buying more plastic bags uh, at the supermarket. Well, why is that? Well, because some people reuse some plastic bags for, uh, for garbage bags, for example. Now, is that, does that mean we shouldn't do it? Well, if you look at the chart, the plus, the increase in the purchase of plastic bags, we're decreasing the use of single plastic bags several times over that change, okay? So it's definitely worth it to enact the ban. So Narberth um, has this in place, and it is a, um, a fee on, on plastic bags, and then a ban on straws. And um, I think uh, it's, a, it's a very small jurisdiction, obviously. Um, Westchester enacted the ban and fee, uh, and it's going into effect June 1st, which is basically the day of the end of the statewide hold. Um, and so it's 10 cents a bag for a compliant biodegradable paper bag with recycled content. Um, there's a fine provision, there's hardship requests allowed, and that's in the draft, by the way, is a hardship request. Um, the Philadelphia ban, uh, so this I don't think is a sensible approach because this is gonna shift 100, almost 100% to paper. So it, there's probably more cost involved to the retailer, uh, and you're really not minimizing waste. The only good thing is, I don't want to minimize it, paper is biodegradable, right? Uh, retailers actually, initially there was resistance. I think the major supermarket chains are really no longer resisting this because they save money uh, if people bring their own bags. Um, so they're not really contesting these laws. Uh, they're happy as long as they can charge a fee for a paper bag, okay? Uh, biodegradable, compostable. There's a lot of confusion because uh, manufacturers are representing that there are compostable plastic bags. They compost under very limited circumstances. They don't really compost in the, they don't degrade in the aquatic environment, for example. So our recommendation is don't put exceptions in here for compostable. Um, if you did, you really need a very strong definition. There's an ASTM standard on what is compostable. And California has actually put that into the state law. <clears throat> So our recommendation is a hybrid ban and fee, like Westchester has done. Um, second best would be Narberth. Definitely don't do a ban only. Um, and I think we've recommended a little bit of a longer time frame for preparation of the retail establishments. Um, and uh, so w what we've given you is a draft of a uh, ban and fee ordinance and a draft of a resolution 
to communicate to the state, we think that you should uh, not make a permanent ban on local initiative and you should really do something on a statewide level. So there's a whole bunch of resources of where the data came from. So that's it on our presentation and you have a copy of the ordinance and the ban and be happy to answer any questions I can, although the caveat is I'm not an expert. <laughs> Thank you for the president. Are there any questions from the board? Mr. Peter, I noticed uh, Narberth did a survey and we're beforehand and they got a lot of support. Is it worthwhile if we were going to um, go forward with this? Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. I went through it very quickly, but there was a very large majority support within Narberth and I think you'll find the same thing within Haverford. Um, I think the, the, the reason to contemplate a survey is the, the uh, you know, there is an opposite point of view, which is a small retailer is going to say, well, I, how am I going to do without plastic bags, okay? And I think the supermarkets are pretty much on board because you go there and you see that they are, they're offering it, they're promoting the use of the reusable bags. Um, maybe the, the, the <clears throat> convenience stores, the drug stores, maybe not so much. But on the other hand, in places uh, that have enacted these laws, they're not necessary, they're not exempted. So they're adapting. Uh, somebody who has a home at the shore was telling me there's a couple of shore towns that have done it. And they go into a Wawa and you know, the, the world hasn't ended. <laughs> uh, but the reason, that, that would be a reason to conduct a survey is to, if you feel that this is somehow controversial, um, you know, gauge what is the support in the community. I think you'll find that it's very, very strong. I'd like to just catter what, um, what's being discussed right now. I think that Norbeth was the only community that did it, were they the only ones? I mean, to conduct a survey to ask people, you know, we have the evidence that it's, it's killing the environment. It's affecting uh, mammals, animals, including humans. Now. So I think it's a waste of time and money to put out a survey. I mean, certainly we want to educate the public as to what we're going to be doing in the future. We should do that. So maybe the, the effective date of July 1st may not be a, a, an attainable goal. I mean, you know, we should discuss this probably in another work session, in the, in the next work session, discuss it further. We have your um, information, which I want to thank you and the EAC for taking this on. Um, I think every day more municipalities are realizing that something has to be done. Certainly the science wasn't there back in the 60s and 70s, but it's certainly prevalent now. Okay. <clears throat> Anyone else? I have a question. Um, Peter, you, you make the foolish mistake of going on the internet. You see all sorts of crazy disinformation out there about plastics and how bad it is or how not bad it is. Um, you have any info on, you know, the commercial fishing industry as opposed to what, uh, you know, consumer plastic does for purposes of the solution? That's one of those things that you see out there on the internet all the time. Yeah, we've had the we had the discussion within EAC that, I mean, this is not a panacea. This is by no means the only source of plastic to the, in the environment. I mean, as you mentioned, fishing, commercial fishing nets are out there in the environment, um, extensive use of plastic for commercial fishing nets, um, everything from monofilament, you know, from that fishermen use to, uh, you know, plastics are pretty pervasive in commerce, uh, but durable goods tend to not end up blowing in the wind and entering our streams and the waterways and being flushed out to sea. So um, I think that this is certainly a good start to solving a, a, at least a good portion of that problem. Is it 
you know, you've seen the documentaries of what goes over the ocean currents and ends up in, you know, certain areas of the world's oceans. It's, an, it's a motley assortment, not just plastic bags, to your point. But um, I think this is a good start. Um, when you're talking about something, well, this like polystyrene uh, packing beads, which have gone out of favor, these are things that tend to go disproportionately end up there because they're blowing in the wind. Um, so I think this is something, uh, th this is a good part of the problem. I, I don't know if that's, I've answered your question. Oh, enlightening. Well, yeah. I mean, the, the nature of the bag is such that they don't, like packing peanuts, they don't, it's not easy to contain them dispose of them and keep them buried or do whatever you're going to do with them. Yeah, and I, I'm, I've done extreme cleanups for the last few years and you see them out there, you know, uh, the, the, the plastic bags, the packing peanuts, I, they're just all over the place, yeah. Didn't some companies do away with packing peanuts? Didn't you and I talk about that? Some of them did. I'm sorry? The packing peanuts, it's, did, are they... Have, have, has the industry cut back on u utilizing them? It, well, because you know, of the... it's, it's really the shippers who are making the choices, and I have definitely noticed that there is less and less use of polystyrene peanuts, and they're using more uh, paper products uh, in air bag, air, air inflated bags, um, and that sort of thing. So uh, polystyrene is, the, the peanuts are difficult to contain. Uh, even when you're, you know, trying to get them all into your garbage. I'm sure you've had you're that experience. Garbage can. Yeah. yeah. Just blow every, they stick to you. Keep you all static. <laughs> Wasn't it amazing? Yeah. I mean, does that any, any other questions for Peter before we? Peter, thank you very much. Very enlightening. I'll let oh. you know that the draft resolution and ordinances have been forwarded to the ordinance committee. And we will discuss these next month at our work session. I did have, I did have one more question. Uh, just that the ban, the Pennsylvania ban that goes out on July twentieth, uh, July first. Is there any, is there any evergreen provision to it? Does, it? does any, does the state have to act for that to go away, or no? Yeah. They, would, they would have to act to have it be in keep place it, beyond keep June thirtieth. Right. Mm -hmm. Is okay. Our next item is the Citizens Forum. We have three registered speaker, our speakers. Our first is Jennifer Coons, reference librarian at the Hafford Township Library. Welcome, Jennifer. Hello, thank you for allowing me to speak. You can um, raise that and, can I? Yes. hey, we don't want to make you bend over on that. <laughs> It's, it's a sensitive mic, you don't have to get too close. Okay. I have a librarian voice, so I, I, I do need a, a <laughs> microphone. Um, I'm just here to speak briefly about one of the programs we have at the library. Um, I am Jennifer Coons, I'm one of the reference librarians at the library, and I also am the coordinator of our Homebound program, which is a delivery service that we offer to members of the township who are unable to leave their homes. And uh, it is a, uh, it's a delivery service that we, it is not age dependent. You can be, usually most of our um, recipients are elderly folks. We serve about 40 people right now. Uh, some of them are at the quadrangle, a lot of them live independently or they live with a caregiver. Um, I, I, I love what I do. We, we, we have a, um, I get to know these folks over time. Um, we offer readers advisory. All they need to do is live in the township and fill out an application form with their information and their reading preferences. Over time, I get to know the types of things they enjoy. We offer uh, different formats, audiobooks, large print, uh, regular print, if, if so desired. Um, we have a uh, fleet of dedicated volunteers who do the deliveries. Um, we deliver in a handy-dandy red bag like this. Um, we also offer uh, um, e-readers, nooks or Kindles, if people enjoy those. Um, and uh, we offer regular monthly delivery or on request. 
for people who enjoy that. Um, and I know uh, one of the things that we, we often hear in the library is that people um, have a hard time finding parking places. So this is one of those things for people who have trouble getting around and walking. Um, if they can't walk to the library, if when they drive they have trouble getting to the library from a parking place, even if somebody can take them. So um, this is a service that uh, we, we do offer, and I, I notice that some folks don't know that. When they learn about it, they're like, oh, I never knew about this. So if you have a parent or grandparent or uncle or aunt or friend or neighbor who might be able to use the service, I have, um, they can contact me at the library. I have some flyers that I brought with me that I can leave here uh, or hand out or leave on the, I don't know where I'm supposed to do that kind of thing, um, but someone will let me know and um, I'd be happy to be available for anyone who is interested. And you can always, you can call the library and ask to speak with Jennifer or just ask to speak with the um, homebound department and that would be me and I'll be happy to, uh, to help you and, and move you forward. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Let me ask some questions. I, could I suggest yeah. that, me, could I suggest that maybe you send uh, uh, all the commissioners a PDF so that we can so distribute we can that, that to our email list. Absolutely. And also I think it's something that should be included in our township newsletter as well. Okay. So for those that don't have access to the internet or email, they get our newsletter and that's a wonderful program that I wasn't aware of, so thank you. Thank you very much. Our second speaker is Mr. Chad Brooks. Good evening. Good evening, uh, Chad. The, uh, I like to come a couple of times here and tell you about the Grange. I'm the, uh, your representative on the, the Grange estate. Uh, bring you up to date, uh, we had a very successful holiday season, and I'll just uh, read from Kathy Parkinson's uh, little report. Uh, the trains in Winterfest brought a lot of people and visitors to the Grange this season. The trains were a big hit. The children were able to run their own trains in the stalls out front in the carriage house. A lot of positive input about the scenery. We did something new this year. Uh, we had a winter fest, a tree lighting ceremony, and we got almost 700 visitors that night. Very scary for us. We didn't know if anybody would show up. It got to be towards six o'clock. I didn't see a lot of people. I thought, oh my God, nobody's gonna come. And we ended up with 700 people. Santa Claus read uh, the night before Christmas to the kids, and it was a tremendous success. Uh, uh, the, they have worked the area out so that the there wasn't a lot of congestion in the train area, and, uh, and the house tours were very popular that night. We did something also new this year. We did uh, nighttime hours on December 23rd and January 6th. January 6th was so-so, but December 23rd was a huge hit. Uh, we had uh, 250 people come that night, and I don't know if this is true, but someone told me it was the dad's mom said, Dad, get out of the house so I can finish decorating. Because I thought the 23rd of December, we not, might not get people. But in fact, we did. We got a lot of people. Again, it was very popular. Uh, the, uh, the tr just donations, not the charge for the house tours, but just donations. We got over $3,000 in donations for the, uh, the thing. So Christmas, big success. Uh, you know, please come. Keep it in mind for next year. It's always a, always a great event. Um, the, uh, and the community, we had community groups decorate trees. So if you know anybody, if you have civic groups or you know people want to do it, the farmer's market did the, uh, the kitchen tree this year, for example. And we, we put their name down, we give them credit. So if people want to participate that way, uh, that was a lot of fun. Uh, the, uh, I just want to give a shout out to the young people. The Interact and the, the Business Leaders Club at the high school provided as volunteers to take the decorations down. They provided uh, supplementary guides during the season. The kids were great. I, I can't say enough about them. They really, really helped out. And it's good to see young people getting involved. Uh, and uh, in February, we had a tremendous event. We had George and Martha Washington visit the Grange. And they, it, was a, it was from the Historical Theater. It was a joint project between us and the Historical Society. And, uh, uh, it was, the actors are John Loops and Carol Spack, but they, once they're in character, you would not believe that they are not George and Martha Washington. And the program is in perfect, perfect felicity, and it's about their marriage, and it's all based on documents, real documents, letters that they wrote to each other over their 40-year marriage. Uh, absolutely fascinating. 
and, uh, and George Washington was tremendous. And uh, my neighbor, Evan Tavio, is reading Founding Brothers, a very difficult book. And we, we spend an evening talking about and discussing some of the bigger vocabulary words. And he had a question about Washington's farewell address. Who you may know, Hamilton wrote it, but it was George Washington's idea. And I asked him that, just sprang it on. He took questions at the end, completely in character, explained why he worked on the farewell address, what he intended. It's considered the fourth most important document in American history after the Declaration of Constitution, Gettysburg Address, and Washington's sure. farewell address. And it's very applicable today because it's about factionalism and fire, fire, foreign entanglements in our affairs. So it's very, very apropos, and, and he did a great job. So if you ever have a chance to see them, if we're able to do a program like that, it was, it was magical. It was absolutely magical to see it. Uh, you guys had worked out. We had a, uh, a grant. We fixed the lower spring house. It was completely repaired. And two weeks later, a tree fell on it. Uh, it's, being re it's actually they started already repairing it. We don't have to wait another two years. And uh, we feel a little jinx, but, uh, but work is on it. I want to thank Amy and Dave for getting right on it and doing it. So there are all the good things we're doing. Some of the things that we need your help with are, we want to convert from oil to gas. That's a project that started a couple years ago, but we really should have gas in there. Uh, we're very concerned about the electric. Amy is aware of it. We're working on the electric. That's a very, very important in the old house to get that up to speed and, and get it checked. We, we, we put a new alarm system in, and the alarm was showing that we had electrical problems. So, uh, so we've got to get that done. Uh, there are two walls that are in disrepair that need to be fixed. That's a long-term project, but just putting it in your mind, we have to find someone who is a good state, uh, still amazing to do it. And I know this is a big lift, but I would really, really like to see uh, the amphitheater be ADA compliant this year. There was talk about it uh, previously, Township helping by putting in a, a ADA compliant walkway. And if we could get that done, there are a lot of programs we could, we could actually be a revenue generator because that amphitheater would bring in uh, different groups and different activities that we could charge fees for. Uh, so we would really like to do that. Uh, we're doing well though, uh, and I really, really thank the commissioners for their support. I have the, the programs here that are coming up. Of course, everything is dependent now on, uh, on the COVID-19 and and whether we're gonna be able to do it, but March 22nd, we're gonna have a drop off, it worked out great last year, for Attic Treasures. Uh, the sale benefits us, that, that happens April 4th, and we also have the house, that's the first day the house will be open. And uh, the uh, Attic Treasures brings in a good amount of money, so there's stuff you wanna downsize, you wanna get stuff out of your house. Ooh. Come and uh, give it to us, March 22nd. We'll take it down and set it up for you. Uh, Arbor Day is always a big celebration at the Grange, and Seventh Heaven will be participating in the this year. This is the uh, group uh, from Harvard uh, Junior High that, and high school singers, and they're fantastic, really fantastic. And then the next program after that will be uh, August 6th, the Magic Show and Ice Cream Show. And I also included in here for your perusal, we have a program called Pater uh, Pandora's Garden that's for toddlers. And then there are two uh, day camps during the summer, uh, one for young children, uh, four to six, and one for children seven to 11. So they'll be on the paper there for you to see. Uh, do you have any questions for me? Any here. questions? No, but thank you very much. It's a okay. great job. Great to the volunteers, and thank you. Yeah, well, thank you. And uh, just on a personal note, I'm going to give something out to the commissioners. I'm looking particularly at Dr. Hart and Mr. McCluskey to join me May 9th when I finish the program. On the run? Run it. Give it a walk. Good job. We can just pass them down, that's easier.
take my you give it to Dr. Hart. Looking forward to it, Chad. Hey, hey, uh, Chad, Chad, can you send us a PDF? Yeah. Yeah. Upcoming activities. Great. What would you like? Uh, just the uh, upcoming activities. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, we have to actually have a full bloom schedule. Great. That's Happy great. super. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Brooks. Our third registered speaker is Ms. Jane Hall. Good evening, gentlemen and uh, lady. Nice mm -hmm. to see you, Amy. Thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. Uh, Peter, uh, congratulations, wonderful job. I'm not seeing where it, He's in the uh, back. The UK established in 2015, you know, five pence charge for plastic bags. Consumers went down 90%. I was over there and it shocked me but it, it, at the time, but when you think that that was five years ago, it's a, it's a simple thing. It's a really great thing that this township can do. Just a comment that it's kind of a simple political pass that I, I, I think uh, you can get done. I'm here, guess why, to speak just for a couple minutes about the library. I see that you're voting on Brookline this evening and I just wanted to kind of revisit the library. It's hard to believe that uh, it is eight years ago that Commissioner Wexler was the president of this board and he asked me to be the liaison to the library. Uh, at that time, and I won't uh, belabor the issues because all of you know that, I found the library to be in incredible disrepair. I was astounded at the condition and the need for a new library within this township. I am astounded that we don't have progress at the library yet. We're standing in a building that all of us worked very, very hard to get. I work out at the CREC, and I think of many of you, uh, particularly Mario and Tim Denny and people that worked very, very hard to get that done, and I enjoy it every day. And Saturday morning I was there and there are little kids having a wonderful time. It plays into the cornerstones of a community, and as all of us know, a library is one of those cornerstones. Not everybody wants to run on the treadmill Saturday morning. A lot of people like to take their kids to a library and have the access to things that maybe they don't have at home. Uh, I feel so strongly that the <clears throat> Brookline, we looked at that when I was put on a search committee with Mr. Blackwell and Christine Ferris. We felt like it was a great spot. We were told by the school board that that was not feasible at that time. Uh, it's my understanding that you do have that and that you have a vote this evening. I'd like to just say, I, I think the Brookline building, you know, there's some really beautiful things. The stonework about it uh, would be lovely to preserve if you could. I think it would be a great location for a library. I think that the current library, I haven't really seen everything that we hoped would have happened over the last several years. I'd like to thank the library board. I know they worked tirelessly. I attended all those meetings in four years. And I would like to point out that the commissioner of the seventh ward at that time never once attended one of those meetings or walked through the library to understand the devastation and the issues at hand for that library. Uh, I cannot speak for the current seventh ward commissioner. I would like to say to you that I implore you to do the right thing, to take this on as a challenge for you, to make sure that we have a library that is suitable for this community this community's come a long way with a good board of commissioners that's taken a long time to establish. And I think that all of us have things that we like to take charge and kind of work through, and I hope you will do that. I would also like to ask uh, Commissioner Hart if you will do the same. I know Brookline sits within your ward. And again, I didn't really ever have any positive feedback from the ward commissioner at that time either. So I'd like to just encourage you to take the lead to try to get this finished uh, and really give something to this community that we so desperately need. It's been a long time coming and I hope that your vote this evening is thoughtful. I'm sure it has, I'm sure you've had many time, a lot of time and many conversations to try to get the right thing done. So I put it in your hands and I encourage you to allow us to drive by something every night with children and families that can really benefit the educational process in this community. Thank you. Thank you very much. At this time, we'll move to the open forum. And at this portion, 
any member of the public that would like to speak to the board is, can move up to the podium to do so. It, this portion, it has to be on something that is on this evening's agenda, though. At the end of the meeting, we'll have another open forum where you can talk about anything. But this section now, of the non-registered speakers, is for any item that is on this evening's agenda. Is there any member of the public on this side that would like to speak? Go ahead, Ms. Cohen. I didn't see her. Susanna Baruco, 805 Clifford Avenue. I want to just start by apologizing. I think my uh, time at the podium last week was maybe a little heated and certainly unintentional. Um, I just want to get go again on the record. I know I'm speaking of records, I'm sounding like a broken record, but to encourage the commissioners, um, I'm not opposed to a better library for the township. I think it's a great thing. Um, I'm not sure why uh, the demolition of the Brookline School has to precede a decision on the library, and I encourage you all to wait. I know that uh, it was said several times at the meeting last week that there's no more green space being created, and I would offer that there are no more buildings of quality being created either. It's a stone building, a, a building of quality that you will not build today, as you will remember when the uh, library options were put up and there were a couple of questions about the drive it that was proposed for the new building at Brookline. You're not gonna get a stone building. You're not gonna get the quality of that building for any use. Um, I also wanna just say that um, I know that the building, Brookline is not listed in the Historic Resources Survey and I acknowledge that, but I think we should also acknowledge that the Board of Commissioners, perhaps not all of you, but the Board of Commissioners did establish an ordinance, an anti-demolition ordinance to protect historic resources in the township. And even if it's not listed in the historic resource survey, I think it should be acknowledged that the building is eligible for the National Register. It does meet the criteria for a historic building in our township as established by our ordinance. And I would hope that you would at least acknowledge that based on the ordinance that was passed by this body. So I ask that at a minimum, you wait on demolition. I don't really understand why the building has to be demolished so quickly, unless it's simply because the, the bid is gonna expire. And if the bid is gonna expire, I'd be surprised if the proposer would not extend it. So thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Ban. Colette Bannon, 334 Sagamore Road. And um, I'm sorry, I printed all this out and I misplaced it, so I'm gonna have to read it off my phone. I wanted to kind of put into the record a letter that was um, addressed to each of you by um, Greg, that was written by Greg Pritchard, who is a historic preservationist. And he works um, in that capacity for Lower Marion Township, but has done a lot of work on the architect of the Brookline School building. Um, a lot of you know discussion on Facebook about you know why 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 not why are we trying to save it and it's because it does have some historical uh, value and integrity. So um, I just wanted to kind of read a little bit about the history of the building so that it goes into the record. Um, David uh, Knickerbacker Boyd was an architect who worked uh, was in, in the midst of a great number of, of architects uh, at that time, like uh, Horace Tum Trumbauer and uh, William Price. And um, Mr. Pritchard says that um, you know his father went to Brookline School, and it was only recently that he decided to see um, and discover the history of the building. I was surprised to learn that. Uh, the name of uh, David Knickerbacker Boyd was associated with it because he's been studying the work of this prominent local architect uh, since he was in high school. He became fascinated with the history of the region and its architecture and his name kept appearing. So both of the National Register of Historic Places listed landmarks of downtown Wayne, the Wayne Hotel and the Saturday Clubhouse were designed by Boyd. Uh, the Mediterranean villas of the Walton Estate, now on the campus of Eastern University, came from the mind of Mr. Boyd. Just as familiar to Wayne residents like me were ch churches, commercial blocks, and the school district's administration building that were his Boyd's creations. He um, 
based on the state preservation ordinance assessment of similar school buildings, especially in Haverford Township, there's no doubt, Mr. Pritchard uh, asserts, that the Brookline School could be deemed eligible for the National Register of Historic Places. The former Lanark School, for example, was determined to be eligible in 2016 and was listed on the National Register a year later. More comparably, the former Chestnut Walled School was deemed eligible in 2003, shortly before its demolition. And Chestnut Walled and Brookline Schools were based on the same void design, although scaled differently to best serve the populations of the communities in which they were built. It is this aesthetic unity that sets the historic schools of historic Haverford Township apart from other nearby communities. The harmony of materials and design across the township school system spoke to a singular vision that carried through all the way into the 1920s with the construction of a new high school, which is now the Haverford Middle School, also designed by David K. Boyd and his firm Boyd, Abel, and Gugert. Most remarkable is that so many of these historic schools remain standing even as educational needs have grown beyond the edifices. Perhaps the older buildings remain because the community found value in their mere presence even when new uses were not obvious. There may have been a recognition, rightfully, that structures like these can never be replicated and that for generations they have stood as symbols of the neighborhoods that grew around them. The homes, stores, and schools in these neighborhoods grew from barren ground concurrently with one another. As such, it is a loss to the entire community when these structures, which seem the most permanent, are lost. So I just want to put that into the record too and remind the board that this building was built um, before about a whole quarter of the, the buildings that are on our historic resource inventory now were built. So it definitely has historic value to the neighborhood. I, I agree with Susanna, why the rush for demolition if the whole decision about where the library is going or not going has not been determined and none of us are against a new library, believe me, but that building has a certain um, place in the neighborhood's history. And if it is deemed to be demolished, then maybe there are aspects of it that can be preserved or um, details of it that can be incorporated into a, a newer building or reuse of the stonework or something just to um, pay homage to this prominent part of our community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Rebecca Timma, 1201 Edgewood Road. Um, I just want to comment on the fact that I believe we're all in the process of undergoing a survey for our comprehensive plan looking forward, and I haven't seen any results. I know I've answered the online survey as a resident of the township, and I encourage you not to vote to dem demolish the Brookline School until you have those results and publish those results because then we'll be able to see what the needs of the community moving forward are. And perhaps it would be more prudent to take that step after we see the results, after we understand what is it that our community needs moving forward before we rush to demolish the building that we can't get back after that. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the set? Yes, sir. Good evening, everybody. Joe O'Brien, 406 Kenmore Road here in Havertown. Just one comment on the proposed demolition of Brookline School. The Oakmont School was built two years before the Brookline School. It was renovated in 2008 for only $6 million. I don't know what that would be in today's dollars as far as uh, pricing for renovating the building. I personally have not seen anything anywhere as far as costs for renovating. But the Oakmont School, to quote the CB development website, uh, quote, individual in part, the renovations included individual offices, working suites for staff, meeting space, new elevators, restrooms, handicap access, all new mechanical, electrical, plumbing, and life safety systems, end quote. I don't see why that couldn't be done to the Brookline School, uh, which is two years younger than the Oakmont School. I know the township had a need for the Oakmont School for offices and other township services. If this was going to be demolished, uh, it can be done. It was done in Oakmont. 
I don't know if the township has as much need for the building as it did for the Oakmont School, but I just wanted to say my piece. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so we're in support of banning. Could you state your name and address, oh, please? Oh, yes, okay, sorry. Um, I'm Lauren Baxter, 1713 Sue Ellen Drive in Havertown. And um, I'm on a ferry, 2500 West Darby Road, Havertown. So we're um, with, like, representing the youth of the community, so, yeah. So around five years ago, Barack Obama signed the U.S. into an agreement saying that we would limit to increase the world's average temperature. And by doing that for global warming, we will help with the plastic bags and all that. But five years later, the U.S. still hasn't moved a muscle. In fact, we've be moved backwards and become like that kid. The kid who is lazy and fights for nothing except for the right to play video games in school. We've become the kid who wants no homework just so they can sit around on the couch and eat junk food for hours at a time. We've become like that kid. Five years later, the second largest carbon emitter in the world is planning to drop out of the agreement that would, according to Barack Obama, make our world safer and more secure, more prosperous, and more free. In 2017, President Donald Trump announced his intentions to withdraw from the Paris Climate Paris Climate Agreement, et cetera. So we're hoping that you guys will ban plastic bags and put a fee on them so we could go back to where we were. Um, I say yours. No, this. This. Um, we need to be present. Teachers can't hear you when you mumble, and the world can't hear you if you don't express your opinions. We need to act now and find a solution. Solving climate change is like freeing an angel from jail. She's attached to the wall with spiked chains, and any time you try to pull her free, her rings just get more and more bloody. However, if you pull her fast enough, and with enough force, she might, she will be able to break free. It might be agonizing, but she will heal eventually. I have a dream that America will have the motivation to pull the angel out of the chains, and enough courage to believe that we will benefit, even though we risk the angel being injured. Using green energy is beneficial, well, other parts, um, and using and banning plastic bags is one step toward the future. So we don't have to completely re revert back to be, like being cavemen and having nothing, but we can do something to help our world and our future, and we cannot fight for our destiny, but we can steer it in the right direction. Um, we think that banning plastic bags is one of the steps that we need to take to help the environment. And I know that our world is much different from then it, different than it was when you guys were growing up, but I wouldn't say, and I wouldn't say that all that changes for the better. If we don't do something now, then our future and your children's future and our children's future, et cetera, will be more worse than it is now. So we implore you to do something to help our environment, to change the world and to make an impact. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, uh, I think I can speak for all of us on this part that we're very heartened to see somebody of your age and your generation coming to these meetings <laughs> and providing your input to us. So thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you. Here, here. Is there anyone else on this side who would like to speak? I follow that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Um, thank you. Um, Forgive me, I was going to also speak tonight about the library, but my understanding is that because it's not on the agenda for tonight, was it initially going to be on the agenda and then it was changed? No, just the demolition of the week? library. Just the demolition okay. of the properties on the agenda. Okay. Could you just state your name and address? Yes, I'm so sorry. It's Stacy Maddox. My address is 38 East Turnbull Avenue in Havertown. Um, I wanted to just speak briefly um, in follow-up to your meeting last week with regard to the Brookline School. Mm -hmm. I wanted to commend the Board of Commissioners for pausing to responsibly consider adaptive reuses for the school prior to making the decision to demolish the building. As a resident, I appreciate the Commissioner's responsibility to taxpayers, and I think part of that is exploring all possibilities before making a decision. My understanding when I left the meeting last week was that we were going to be continuing to have a dialogue about the building before a decision was being made, so I was kind of a little bit surprised tonight to see it was on the agenda to be have a final vote. Um, once the building's gone, it's gone. 
Um, the greenest building is the one that is standing. Last week, it was discussed that a developer might find a more cost-effective rehabilitation estimate. Um, the building has already successfully, successfully been used as an early child care center and senior center, both of which are community uses and also desperately needed in our township. Additional parking would not be needed because it was previously used for that purpose. The township would be a hero to help facilitate this for the community. The building and playground would remain the same and would not have an impact on residents and, and save the building, which would be a win-win. Um, in echoing Susanna and Colette's comments, although the Brookline School is not currently listed on the Historic Resource Survey, it was designed by David Knickerbocker Boyd who is a prominent local architect and is also significant for, to generations of Haverford Township residents and the surrounding community. I also would like to add, um, in, in response to what the gentleman had said a few moments ago, with regard to Oakmont, the school district did a beautiful job renovating and adaptively reusing the Oakmont building for our community. So thank you very much for your consideration to possibly, if nothing else, um, pause until the comprehensive plan is completed to determine if there is possibly a use for this building because once it's gone it's too late thank you very much thank you <laughs> anyone else has brian good evening i'm uh, brian ramona 14 north belfield in havertown First on the plastic bags and the bags. Um, I grew up, actually I was born in San Jose, California, so I'm a little familiar with the bag issues out there. I remember when they first, when they first started doing that a few years ago, I still go out to visit my family. Nothing worse than walking into a supermarket and having a whole cart full of things and then you say, do you have any bags? <laughs> no. Well, we can get them to you for 10 cents a piece. I'm like, ah, oh, all right. First year that happened, it was a little annoying. Second year it happened, okay, I'm used to this. I think by the third year, I started bringing my own bags, and I think it does make a lot of sense that we start moving in that direction. I myself, people always stop me at Giant because I'm the guy who walks in with the reusable bags that I lay across the cart and I load my cart as I'm going through. And people, where do you get those? Those are great. They're on Amazon, by the way, if you want to find those. But it would be a really good idea, and I think I commend all of the work that has been done to lay the groundwork for that. Um, but I really want to uh, kind of piggyback, and it probably sounds like piling on, but on the Brookline School. I was heartened last week at the work session to see many of you, um, and Mr. Oliva, I'm going to point you out, because you said something at the end of the night that I think made the most sense of all. Once it's gone, it's gone, and we can't go back and, and relitigate that. I go back to one of the greatest presidents, if not the greatest presidents of the United States, and John F. Kennedy. Back in 1962, in September, he spoke these words, we choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Be really easy to knock down a building that's not being used, that really seems to have no use at all. Absolutely be very simple to go spend five hundred, six hundred thousand dollars $600,000, knock it down, and move on from there. But a hard decision might be the one that will, in the long run, give us a building that we can be proud of. There are 370 school buildings in the state of Pennsylvania that are on the National Historic Register or on some kind of a historic register and are protected. Brookline School isn't there yet, but I believe it should be. And I hope that tonight you guys will consider that in what you decide to do with the Brookline School, and hopefully in the future we can see it blossom into something that we can all be proud of, both in the neighborhood and out. And that doesn't mean I don't want a library, because I think the library is important too, but I think we can have everything coexist one way or another. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else on this side? Go ahead. Hello, my name is Sherry Forsey Grapp, and I live at 107 Landaff Road. I served on the board for the library 
more than 15 years ago. And when I was on the board, what we should do about the library was an ongoing discussion. And when I think about the Brookline School, it seems to me that it, there have been a lot of great points made about why we should preserve it. And I hear those points. I'm a medievalist by training, which means I study things that are like 800 years old, and I want to preserve every single one of them. But sometimes I think we need to leave behind the history so that we can move into the future and really prepare for that future. So I hope you'll really consider why voting to take down this school is in the best interest of Haverford Township so that we can make space for what we can be in the 21st century. Because right now, we don't really have a town center. This building looks great. It's a beautiful building, but it's where the police are and all the regulations and all of our, um, you know, the health department, et cetera, et cetera. And we need a different place for us all to congregate. So I really hope that you'll think very carefully about how to use that space at the Brookline School to really, um, to really bring us forward so that we have a place for all of our children to go and for us to go as a community. Because we don't have a lot of spaces like that. We have plenty of parks, I think, lots of green spaces and ball fields. But we only have one library and this looks like the best place to put it, so it will serve everybody. So I hope that you'll weigh the pros and cons and, and give this your very best decision for the future of our township. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Anyone else on this side? This side of the room? Is there anyone from the left side of the room or my right side. There being none, that concludes the open forum. I'd like to thank everybody for coming up, especially our two young constituents who gave their opinion on their concern for the future of our earth and our township. So we appreciate it and we'll be doing discussion. The, the question I, I would like to answer very quickly, a couple people brought up why it, it's not like we snuck this on the agenda. We are required to put on there. We had we went out for proposal. Proposals came in. We received an extension on the proposals that ends on March 31st. So we have to take some type of action before uh, the proposals run out. So that's that's why it's on the agenda. So whatever your uh, not so much opinion, but understanding of what we talked about last week, that's why it's on there. It has to be either yes, no, or or whatever it has to be decided by this meeting because the proposals expire. So we have to take some type of action. So that's, that's why it's on the agenda. It wasn't shoved down our throats or anything. It's just we took action a year ago to generate the proposals, and this is the time it has to be done. That being said, I appreciate everyone's comments. And the next item on the agenda is a contract award, number four. This is a motion to award the Brookline School Demolition contract to Empire Dismantling Corporation of Grand Island, New York, in the amount of $569,000, submitting the lowest responsible bid. I'd like to have a motion made for that. So moved. Moved by Commissioner Siegel. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Commissioner Holmes. Discussion. I have a question for our township engineer. Um, some things were said at the work session. I just want to clarify is the building structurally sound? Commissioner, I'm, I'm not a structural engineer, but in my opinion, there's nothing imminently dangerous in that building right now. And the, the estimates that we came up with of nine to $10 million to renovate, <coughs> would renovate to, would enable the previous use, a senior center and childcare to go back in, is that? Again, I'm not, that's not my expertise, but the building core is there. There is all the mechanical and everything that is arguably outdated, is outdated, that would need to be replaced and updated. So that is a significant cost. And don't forget, part of this is demo contract is also removal of uh, asbestos-containing materials and other hazardous materials in there, too. 
But that way, that, that price. was part of the nine to ten million dollars that we had heard before. Is that right? Um, to be honest, Commissioner, I don't. I'm not sure how that nine to ten million came about. Okay. My recollection it was it was approximately nine million dollars, as Mr. Pannoni stated, to bring it up to code, so that it would at least pass codes, and that I believe did include asbestos and lead removal from the building. It would have to, to to bring it up to code. So just by there, but it was a minimum of $9 million and it's arguably it's probably got worse since there's a hole in the roof and there's a lot of water in the basement and stuff like that. So, but anyway, to answer your question, my recollection is Mr. Pannoni said it would be about approximately $9 million to bring it up to code with still containing all the concrete bearing walls that are make it structure that it was. But to clarify that commissioner, nine. That cost to bring up the code would have included the mechanical work right. and, and the uh, abatement and everything. Right. You're correct. Correct. Uh, Bill. Mr. Siegel. Yeah. I, I'd like to ask Township Manager, if we do not approve the demolition, are there conditions or costs that the township would incur, begin to incur, et cetera, as a result of main, keeping the building at this time? Initially, there would be costs associated with keeping the building at this time. Um, we obviously have an alarm system in the building that would be an ongoing minor cost, but we're talking about whatever work needs to be done to the roof. We would like to preserve the building, and if that's the board's desire, then we would have to repair the roof or replace the roof uh, in, in the short term. We also would certainly need to put a uh, fence around the building, in my opinion, because it could be perceived to be an attractive nuisance. I know. Uh, I know my behavior as a kid, and I think it's it's perhaps an, uh, an attractive nuisance where children might like to be. And why do we need the roof? I I, I don't know that the public knows that. Uh, there is there is uh, water damage in the building. The roof is leaking. I hear all these co or all these uh, concerns up here, but um, I think that we should exhaust everything that that, that we can, and then uh, decide what to do with this. So I move to ta table. I'll, I'll, I'll second that. There's a motion made to table and second it. Please call the roll for the table. Mr. D'Amelio? Yes. Mr. Oliva? Yes. Mr. McCluskey? No. Mr. Siegel? No. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Mr. Quinn? Yes. Dr. Hart? Yes. Mr. Holmes? No. Mr. Wexler? No. 5 4 table. Motion is tabled. Mr. President, I have a suggestion. No. Just moving forward, if I would vote to demolish the building if we're going to build a library there, I, I have a feeling that's not going to happen. And if we don't decide to build the library there, I would say that we should form a committee with some commissioners, with some township officials, and with some residents who have an interest in preserving the building, give them to the end of the year to look at what could be done with the building and come back to the board with proposals, and we can vote on this again at that point. Chair, I, I agree with that, and I, would, and I would like to be part of that committee. I, I would definitely like to be part of that committee. And I would, too. Okay. Um, that sounds like a reasonable thing. We, depending on the use, we would then have to go back to the party that sold it to us and get permission for whatever use that we'd have to do. Our agreement with the school district was for the benefit of the public. So if it was developed for a profit or nonprofit business, like a daycare, if they want to renovate the building, uh, we would have to get accord with, with the school district and, and go from there. I think that's- If we're talking about forming committees, though, can, can we please, next month as a board, state a direction as to what we're doing with the library, whether we're going to try to, our purpose is to renovate at Mill or if it's to try to build new at Brookline or wherever it is. We should state a purpose and move forward with that. Because as it stands now, we have three buildings that are sitting either empty or not up to their full capacity. So the library, as has been stated for the past year, needs renovation and it needs work to be done up to its full capacity. We have the old township building that is serving as a glorified parking lot at the moment. And we have this old Brookline building that is totally empty and 
and just sitting there. So I, I again, I will say, I understand everybody's opinion, and I can guarantee you we're not going to make everybody happy with whatever we do because we can't make everybody in this room tonight happy, but we have to make a decision. And this is, we have numbers now, we should just make a decision, and it should be on an agenda or it should be something in the month of April. I, would, I, I, I would totally agree with you. It's, yeah. uh, I think we've, we've, we've caused the library enough delay that if we're going to do it and they want to go ahead and renovate, we need to get that moving. Uh, to do it. it sounds like from what Commissioner Hart has proposed, that's going to take a long time. That's going to take more than next month. Uh, people have mentioned the comprehensive plan. If it's going to be incorporated in there, that's going to take months and months. And I think we've held up the library long enough. So I, I would agree with your assessment that we need to vote on that next month and get moving. It's unfortunate, but if there's another development there, we'll have to fight that with the neighborhood because whatever it's going to do is going to require probably at least, if not as much parking as a library would have uh, based on the square footage of the building. So, um, I, but I, I agree. I think we've, we, we've got to take action on the current town, the old township building and the renovation of the library, and we need to do it sooner rather than later. Uh, could, could, I just want to clarify something. Um, if, if there needs to be a fence put around uh, Brookline School, why don't we have a fence around the other buildings that we own that are not? Well, why not the township building? Why not the Quattrani building, which are, I mean, there's a lot more traffic um, around the Quattrani building and around the township building. It's being, um, it's being used. It's a parking lot. It's a, it's a par that's correct. It is a parking lot, but the building itself is the, uh, it's an attractive nuisance. The building down at 599, which has been empty for since this building opened two years, um, is, doesn't have a chain link fence around it and hasn't had any issues with it. I, I would have recommended the same approach had those buildings remained vacant for a long period of time. We are using the old township building. There is equipment in that building. We're in there routinely. If if not once a week, multiple times per week. Quatrini, we are in there still in removing there. items that we're going to salvage. That would be next on the list for a recommendation. However, depending on the results of the discussion of the library, we may need to use those buildings. If I Plus, there's a, yeah, go ahead. Right. Right. Well, and, and uh, the, I, two I points. Agree. First, with regard to fencing, it's a, it's a vacant building that needs significant repair. In the last two years, um, and this is something we've discussed on this board and we've discussed with the solicitor, Pennsylvania Supreme Court has dramatically expanded the scope of liability for local governments, state governments, for buildings and property. As a result, this township has already taken other steps the public wouldn't see in order to make sure that buildings including like the, the the rec center all meet the new standards so we are in a different world legally so we have as my opinion as an attorney and i've litigated cases like these a much greater risk of liability that's first second and i don't want to beat this dead horse but we have been talking about fixing the library uh, the library was doing, talking about it before I was on this board, which is a dozen years, 13 years ago now. In 2013, we talked about the need for, for repairs of the library, and this township has pumped a lot of money in there to make it usable and functional. But we have an obligation to the residents, not just the residents around the Brookline School, whose opinions I respect, but of this township, to make a decision because the library is a vital part of this community. And I believe that the board, which we voted on years ago to move forward with renovations, and we decided last year when the Brookline School came out, I don't believe that this board acts responsibly, and I certainly don't believe that we should be waiting for a comprehensive plan to be done. The comprehensive plan told us in 1988 to replace the township building. We were told that in 1927 that it was out of date and was too small. We replaced it in 2015. Comprehensive plans are aspirations. People don't move to communities because of aspirations. They move to communities because of quality of life. The library is the center of quality of life. Lower Marion pumped $28 million into updating all of its libraries 
combined, which would be less than this board committed to building this building and replacing and repairing the library. The li we owe it to the library. We owe it to the residents of this township and to future residents to make a decision and stop holding our library hostage. Commissioner Siegel, I don't think that I, I'm ready to vote next. I, and I didn't say anything about waiting for a comprehensive plan. I think no, most I th of us are ready to vote. We could vote next month. I, yeah, I'm, I'm all for I, we, I think next we're month. probably in agreement. Vote next month on what? On, on, yeah. on what to do with the library. One, one at a time, please. Vote no. next month on what we're going to do with the library. We're going to renovate where you are, or are we going to go to Brookline? Uh, okay. Uh, I mean, but it is going to take longer because now we have to go back out to bid. If we have to well, I, evolve that, so so it, it is going to be well. Down actually, the road. it's going to take longer, but we don't have a plan right. for yeah. the the building at, at if we move it to Brookline. So it was going to take some time anyway. I mean, we would have to put it out to bid. Again. You're right, but um, we're putting it off a month. Well, probably about three. Okay, we've we've tabled that, so we're going to move on. I guess. Um, since the contracts expire, we will have to rebid if we if we decide to demolish it, it has to be rebid again. So, just so we're aware. Item number five is our township manager update. Mr. Berman, thank you. There are two items for the township manager's update this evening. Um, both are equally unsettling. The first one I am going to talk briefly about COVID nineteen, um, and second, uh, our assistant township manager and finance director Amy Cuthbertson is going to give an update. Uh, and some insights in the county's reassessment. So with regard to COVID-19, I'm gonna start by saying that as of 7.15 this evening, we received an email from the Pennsylvania Department of Health telling us that there is no community transmission of COVID-19 detected in Pennsylvania. And what that means is there's no community spread. It means that people have been infected and we know where they got it. In this case, in Pennsylvania, we know that it was someone who had tra traveled to an area where COVID-19 uh, COVID was present. And um, there's no community spread, meaning we're aware of where, where it was contracted and uh, we're, um, we are sure, I'm sorry. The patient had recently traveled to an area where COVID-19 is present. Community spread means that people have been infected with the virus in an area, Pennsylvania, including some who are not sure how or where they became infected. That's not the case here in Pennsylvania. We know where it came from. Um, our emergency management coordinator is John Viola, and our paramedics director is Jim McCanns. We've all met with the school district, and uh, we've been working closely with the school district and the Delaware County Department of Emergency Services to ensure that we are prepared for the impacts of COVID-19. Uh, this morning at 11.30, we met with school superintendent, Dr. Maureen Rushi, and other representatives of the school district. We shared information regarding our plans, and they shared information regarding their plans. The school district is currently operating as usual. There's additional cleaning, there's additional sanitizing, and we're doing the same things in this building, and they are monitoring their attendance and reports of any illnesses. We expect the school district to release additional information about contingency plans on an as-needed basis. This afternoon at about 4.30, we participated in a conference call with representatives of Delaware County Council, the County Administrator, the Department of Emergency Services, and other municipal leaders from throughout the county. We have an open line of communication with the county, and they have assured us that the county is prepared with additional resources should they be needed. We appreciate the calm support from the county leadership. Tomorrow, Jim McCanns is gonna contact our senior care facilities just to make sure we include them and they include us in any contingency plans. These are the types of facilities that can quickly tap our resources, so we need to work closely and understand what each other's plans are. So based on what we know today, the CDC recommends a 14-day quarantine for those who may have been exposed to COVID-19 to see whether flu symptoms develop. The CDC recommends you stay in your own bedroom, use a separate bathroom, wear a face mask around others, don't share dishes, towels, or bedding, but you don't need to move out of your house. Because of the possible loss of personnel due to quarantine, we are working on our continuity of government plan. That means we're planning to modify schedules if it ever comes to that, 
We, we would consider letting folks work from home. We would consider modifying our service levels. We just want to make sure that everyone remains safe and calm. And that's kind of where we are right now. Um, we're in a wait and see mode, and we'll continue to look for the federal and state officials to give us uh, guidance as the situation evolves. Uh, again, at the moment, don't panic. Continue to use the same precautions you would if you had experienced or come into contact with the flu or the common cold. If you do have symptoms of COVID-19 and it's not an emergency, you're asked to call the Pennsylvania Department of Health at 1-877-PA-HEALTH. However, if you have a serious situation that warrants emergency attention, you should always dial 911. Again, remain calm. As of this evening at 7.15 p.m. in an email from the Pennsylvania Department of Health, we learned that there is no community transmission of COVID-19 detected in Pennsylvania. There's one case and it's not community transmitted. We know where we got it. So that's all I have for now. Um, if there are questions from the commissioners or the community, I'd be glad to answer them. I'd be glad to get information from Jim McCanns or our emergency management coordinator, but let me know if I missed anything. I just have a question. Go ahead. A question for Jim and, and uh, the chief. So the police and the paramedics are obviously, the, you're on the front line there. What would have happened? What would happen? Is the county going to be involved? Like say a police officer, God forbid, gets it or paramedics. What would we do? We, we have we have changed our uh, operating plans. Uh, and I had lengthy conversations with Jim also, but as far as the police are concerned, we have given all the tools to the police officers to protect themselves and their families. Uh, we have modified our response to certain medical emergencies because the county is now asking more questions when somebody calls. So if there are any indicators that somebody may have the virus, we have, have a different approach uh, to that property. So we are protecting the police officers the best we can. Granted, we are on the front line and we don't expect any less service, but we have to protect ourselves because we have to maintain our level of service. Oh, I get that, but you have to also include the volunteer firefighters who are out there on the front line as well. Right. But my question is, so a police officer, God forbid, or a paramedic comes down with it, what happens then? Well, he's got to follow the uh, guidelines. He's got to be quarantined. What about force. the rest of the police force? Well, it depends Maybe. who comes in contact with them. It's, it's, it's a concern that we have discussed. And there are contingency plans throughout the county police departments to assist if any police department uh, encounters it. So uh, we, we're, we have a robust department. Uh, if, if one officer in a platoon comes in contact and he, and he uh, then comes in contact with the other officers, we would have to. Uh, uh, quarantine them or self-quarantine, we would make adjustments and schedules to, to cover that squad. I can't so other municipalities would assist. It's, operating. It's, it's, it's our operating procedures. But do you need resource? Do we need any additional resources to sanitize your vehicles after each shift from person to person and spraying and, and we, the disinfectants that we're doing in the We have business. already purchased that. Uh, Jim, you want to give a little more detail on, on where we are with that? Yeah, Bill, you may remember uh, a while ago with the H1N1 breakout, we actually had a fogging system for uh, decontamination of the ambulances. We've uh, just purchased three more components and built three more systems. This should be in service tomorrow afternoon, and we do have the product that is... Uh, approved through our medical director, and I know Dr. Hart uh, took a look at the uh, product as well that is used within the ambulance. And that's, that's like the third step. The first step is obviously our own uh, personal protective equipment, behaviors, uh, and discipline around uh, patients or patients that uh, we suspect may have the illness. We want to give the best care possible, but we're going to protect uh, everybody as well. And then uh, straight up decontamination, wiping down the ambulance, which we do after every call anyhow, and then continue with the fogging type device. But should, so just you, Mr. D'Amelio, with the um, uh, incident, should there be exposure to one of us, it's uh, very much what we get exposed to on any given day. There, there are certainly situations that can reduce the manpower of any given department at a given time. And the county and surrounding medic units do have um, preparation for that. Should something occur, they can help backfill as well, should Marple have a problem, we backfill that direction, and so on and so forth. So it's a redeployment of, uh, of units until the crisis passes. We, we even went further today, uh, if an officer becomes contaminated, 
so he wouldn't have to take his uniform home with him. We have uh, made arrangements to have our uh, clothing uh, decontaminated here in, in, the, uh, in the building. So nothing we could carry it out of either to the dry cleaners or to the uh, officer's home. So we, we've been talking about this internally. Uh, we made steps. We've ordered extra sanitizer before we couldn't get any. Uh, we have an ample supply. We have uh, every officer has a disinfectant. He carries in his car to disinfect his car, uh, paper towels. So we've we've uh, made every, everything available for the officer to decontaminate himself uh, at any given time where he may encounter something. But again, we are going to talk to the fire chiefs, the other chiefs. I mean, the, the, because the, they're on the, accident scene. Someone could be transporting someone and get an accident. And that, that's correct. The. Uh, uh, the, the good part is the fire departments themselves do not go on medical emergencies except to help a medic if, uh, right. if need be. Or so, an yes, uh, masks and their own protective equipment is part of what they would wear uh, in a situation like that, also. And they would also have to be contaminated, too. The, the county did uh, um, issue N95 masks to all volunteer fire departments, all fire departments throughout the county as well, from the county stocks. So, uh, there are so there are measures being taken to make sure that anybody who assists in one of these cases not only is protected, but also there's a flow of information going back to them that should there be a positive or a negative uh, after a case has been suspected, we would certainly let them know uh, through a direct communication that uh, what the next step for them would be. Just one more question, Jim. The N95 masks, do they need to be tested with each individual or no? It, best practices is um, to do some saccharin type testing, which is the hooded testing, which is good. But we can also look at some situations where, um, uh, I mean, we're pretty sure when you have a large person that, and we have a large mask, that's the one that's gonna fit them. But it is, uh, it is best practice, and uh, that is the unit is being made available throughout the county. It's moving around spot to spot. Once it gets in the area, we'll certainly offered to any any uh, rescuer who wants to be fitted. A number of people are already fitted at another job that they have. So there might be a volunteer fireman here who's a medic someplace else who's already been fitted and knows what their mask size and how to wear the mask is, uh, it's already been done. And, and I think it's, we should be clear that the surgical masks do not work. Well, that's actually, um, the N95 mask is for somebody who is not infected meaning that it's, um, let's say, a one-way mask, if you will, prevents you from inhaling any of the particulates that could cause or transmit the, uh, the virus. If you have the virus, you can actually breathe through that mask to an extent. It's not the best mask for that. There's certainly, it will capture some virus, so, but it's not no. made for that. Right. But a surgical mask, though, is two-way. So it does provide... Uh, protection each direction. So if we have a patient, we would place a surgical mask on that patient. Again, fitted is the best way to do it. I mean, we all see on TV somebody putting on a, a surgical mask or you know, if you've worn one as a Halloween costume or something. Um, that's not quite how they work. They need You need to know how to wear one and put one on properly. Any other question? Amy, you have... Um, so I think everybody probably by now has received their reassessment, and if not, it's a fun piece of mail that you'll be getting in the next day or two. So I thought it would be a good idea just to advise the board and advise the public a little bit on some basics, what we've learned and what we expect to happen as we uh, go to the next phase. So a basic overview, this was a countywide court court-ordered process under the director of the Board of Assessment. Um, they have contracted with an outfit called Tyler Technology to go out and reassess every property in Delaware County. This will go into effect January 1st of 21. Uh, like I said, everybody either already did receive or should receive their tentative valuation letters, and it is just what it says. It's tentative. Uh, we were phase four. Um, the county was divided up into four phases. We were the last phase along with Marple, Newtown, Radnor, Springfield. Um, the value that's on your letter, it's a one-page letter that you receive. The value at the bottom says what they're tentatively valuing you at, and that would be your assessment starting in 21. 
that should represent what you could sell your home for in July of 2019. That was the date that they had used as their valuation date. So everybody wants to look at that amount and ask yourself, is that reasonable? Um, some are reasonable high, some are reasonable low. Um, I, as, on a personal level, mine I felt was reasonable high, but I went on to just a, a Zillow online. You can look up any, I looked up all the sales for a comparable house in July of 2019, and it really wasn't that far off from what I was valued. But there are the type of things you just want to be aware of as you're looking at that number to see if it's reasonable. Um, we are also going to say don't panic. Uh, a lot of people, myself included, saw our assessments go dramatically up. So if your assessment doubled, that does not mean in any way, shape, or form that your taxes are going to double. So we wanted to be clear about that and give some reassurances because there are a lot of people who are under that impression. Some people are going up as far as three times their assessment, their original assessment. The other thing to keep in mind is those assessments that we've been using were done in 1998 and were effective in 2000. So they are 20 years old, so you are going to see some growth, especially in our community. Um, virtually, I would assume virtually all of us are going to see an increase in some way, shape, or form from those 1998-2000 uh, figures that we have been using. Many communities in this county are not going to see the increase we are, but I, I would expect that almost every property in Haverford is going to see an increase. Um, along those same lines that your taxes will not go up in the same proportion, each taxing authority will need to reset, and I did want to spend a minute just explaining what this means because not everybody knows what this means. But if our township-wide assessment goes up three times, I can't collect, bill, and assess three times the amount of taxes. You, you all can't spend three times the amount of taxes. So we're going to go through a little example on the next slide and show just how that reset works. Um, and finally, the township will not receive its township-wide reassessment numbers until November, which was um, none too happy to any of the municipal officials that we met with the county last week. Um, but it's going to be very late in the process until we get the official numbers, at which time we can officially reset our 20 rate and then build from there for what increase there will or will not be in 2021. Okay. Does that mean taxes could go down? We just said could um, or could be, right? They could. Any, anything's a could I'm at this kidding. point because we don't have the yeah. figures. <laughs> so this is yeah. a theoretical impact in this example. Uh, the first column is, is what it is today. And I did uh, round everything just for ease of explanation. So right now our assessment, our taxable assessment is about $3 billion. There's our millage rate, 8.487. We generate approximately $26 million in taxes. That's right now. Um, when we get our new figures, we will have to reset. So we're going to assume for this example that the total millage doubles and it goes up to six million. What we're going to have to do oh, in that middle column, billion. six billion, I'm sorry, six billion. Value, millage, assessment. Yes, value yeah, right. You're a six billion dollar assessment. So what we're going to have to do is calculate a new millage rate to equate the same 26 million dollars in tax revenue. So that's what would happen in the final column. And you can see if our assessment doubled, our millage would be cut in half to generate the same $26 million. This is meant to just be a very simple explanation of the concept of reset and to, like I said, put everybody's mind at ease that just because your assessment goes up, it does not mean everything's going to go up at the same clip. This is a theoretical impact for an owner. So we are going to assume the property's original assessment was the 155 area and increased almost double from the reassessment. So you'll see the 155 assessment at our current millage. The annual tax revenue from that property is about $1,318. If we use the increased assessment at the new reset millage rate, the increase, the tax, excuse me, would go up to 1343, which if you compare those two, it's a difference of $25. Now again, this is simply a very easy example to show the concept of reset, okay? From the reset figure, that would become the base to start the budget process for 2021, and there are limits. Uh, this 
municipalities are only permitted to increase taxes by 10%, which this township has never been close to, so I don't think we have to worry about that at all, but many municipalities in the county, um, that will come into consideration for them. So just to sum up, uh, you want to look at that. Please don't just toss it or not look at it. There's a very small window for looking at the figure and getting an appeal with Tyler Technologies. It's 10 days from the date of the letter. So if everybody's letter, I believe, was dated Friday, you have 10 days from there to call and or go online and apply for an appeal. Um, the county and Tyler are not making the tentative values available to myself or the municipality or the staff. We've already had a couple phone calls asking me what their neighbor was. I, I don't have that information and we're not going to get that information until probably November. Um, like I said, when the county announced that it would be that late in the process, uh, there was some opposition from the taxing authorities. They did say they may try to get it to us the end of summer, but that's really the earliest we're gonna have it is the end of summer. Um, if you feel your properties are overvalued, like I said, please call Tyler Technology or go online. You can apply for an appeal hearing online. Um, again, that 10-day period is very important to get that in in time. After the appeal, this initial appeal period is over, everybody will get their final assessment in July of 2020. That is the figure that unless something happens, that's the one that's going to be used. That's when we're hoping us as a municipality will get our totals and be able to start the reset pro process to plan for the future. However, they did let us know that there will be another opportunity to appeal your assessment um, during the normal window, which is that July through October window that's available every year. But they did also mention that they are trying to do that without any cost. I think right now there's a, a $50, $50 fee or something if you appeal your assessment and I believe they're trying to make that a no-charge uh, process. Um, the evaluation hearings, there are four locations for them. If a property owner does ask for evaluation appeal, uh, Concord Township is one of them, East Lansdowne is one, the courthouse is another, and then I think there's a facility near uh, Rosary Park in Media, that's the fourth. So. They are the four places that you would go to, one of those you would be assigned to. Um, the county does have a lot of information out there. Um, some you know, may think it wasn't enough, but there is some out there on their website. They have an FAQ section. They have a video explaining how the whole uh, reassessment process happened, who was doing it, how they did it. That type of thing was not done on the township level, so we don't have a lot of details, but there were certified appraisers as part of the team that valued all the properties, so hopefully we have some accurate figures. Um, but until, until. He's um, chopping. Just, I, I, I'm yeah. gonna chop you. <laughs> until, I just. I just, just slide, that's all. It's I just, just wanted to say, until we get those township-wide figures, we really can't do the reset process and give people an idea of what their taxes would be under the new assessment. Has Tyler published anywhere what its standards for the appeal are, what people are supposed to raise? Um, it, can, it has to be something more than my neighbor is $5,000 more than me. It has, you have to have concrete facts is what we were told last Thursday when we went to a meeting there. Um, bring comps from Zillow, like, like I did. Go, go in July 2019 and look at actual sales for a house of your size and scope and bring that with you. Bring pictures of your house, you know, if you, there's something structurally inadequate or inaccurate about your house that you want to bring to their attention or something special that brings down the value of your home. Bring pictures to the appeal hearing. But bring factual context, not just my neighbors lower than me. Have, um, have they indicated whether any values will go up without an appeal between now and July? No, from what we're told, this is the this is the value. Unless you appeal it, it will be this. I believe the only real window they gave that, and it wasn't going up, it was more going down, that if for some reason, if you have 10 houses on your block and eight of the residents appeal, and they all have the same opinion that that neighborhood just isn't garnering those prices, then they will bring the entire block down. So you might see an across the street um, reduction, but not an increase. 
So, Amy, when will you have the uh, township-wide value? Um, um, they said as late as November, as, as early November. as late summer. So we're hoping sooner the better, because at that so time... So at that point, we'll also have um, what Upper Darby's would be and Marples and everybody... I don't know can... if they're going to make all of that public to all of us. Eventually, it'll be on public access on the, town on the county website, but... Right now, we're just looking for our township numbers, which we're not going to get until. So those that'll days. set the school and the township taxes, but the county taxes will be established by the market value of our township uh, total Plus value, our real estate relative. value, and commercial relative to other communities. Correct. So we won't get that. That's more likely to increase. Uh, in, in my, I would my, think my, my guess. Gut, my gut instinct is that we will probably see the most impact at the county bill because of all the municipalities. Several, as we know, their values would probably go down and they still have to operate on their same budget as to what they're used to generating. So other municipalities are going to be making up the difference. Right. But they, they did not get into specifics as to how they were going to communicate their reset process and how they were going to get that out to the public. Okay. The county. Could I, Bill, could I make a suggestion yep. uh, that we make this a separate uh, video clip? Okay. Excellent presentation. Sure. Very informational. I, I think if we could put this as a separate YouTube clip, and then we could email sure. it out to our constituents or on our list so they can, I think That's it's fine. coming from you, it give people a lot of comfort. So. You can put it on the cable okay. channel. Yeah, yeah. And, and so it'll also be on our YouTube channel as a separate that? clip. It'll a separate clip. YouTube channel if it's a separate clip, that'd be great that we can just email it. Thank I'm you. a little concerned about that one slide that goes from 150 to 300 and says a $25 tax increase. That is just an example that you, mm -hmm. that's a purely mathematical example, yeah. and I do not want it to mislead people. That this, this leveling process is gonna make a lot of old historic homes here where people had mm -hmm. assessments that were $95,000, $110,000, yeah. that are now in the 300s, 400s. That's being made up for by these assessments that were seven hundred, eight hundred thousand mm dollars -hmm. for the first purchase sale price right. of the home and it's dropped i think i i, I would I, I thought the math of the previous one about 26 million dollars was great i'm very concerned though about putting that next slide out there that does an example of 150 to 300 because i, I know my entire neighborhood is full of exactly that that mm -hmm. change from people in the hundreds to people now in the two to three hundred range and if they get more than a $25 increase, there's going to be a lot of pitchforks and porches. Absolutely. And that's the risk with any kind of example. Kind of, you know, that's not going well, to apply to I everybody. Like global yeah. example. I like yeah. your macro yeah. example, but I'm mm -hmm. really concerned about that. Commissioner Holmes, if maybe um, if, as, as a workaround with that, because I did think it was valuable as just sort of a, a mathematical example, that, that, that sort of stamp that they have on things that says draft, if we could put that a stamp on that says example mm -hmm. that is yeah. diagonal in red across the figures, it might, I'd use hypothetical or hypothetical. I don't know. It's a, okay. I, people could be I don't, assumed. I'm not tied to it. I just, I do it think it's, the reality of the well, I think we can trust the residents to, to become read expectations. it and not be. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're tying them to a and that, and that was uh, all, all good comments, but Commissioner Holmes's concern was a concern even when we were putting this together. But we really did want to explain to people what the reset function was. Like most people, when they call and we say we're going to reset the tax, they're like, well, what does that mean? So this was just a, a like I said, a simple no, mathematical sure. explanation as to what that concept but, would be. But the and reality a lot of us is, went through this. I mean, the reality is, I may pay twenty-five dollars higher. And you may to pay twenty five dollars lower because right. we're gonna we're gonna balance out right. at that twenty zero sum okay. game. So yes. we're actually, so yes. and that was the other the other thing we wanted to get to people is that as a taxing authority, I billed and collected twenty six million in two thousand. I'm going to be doing the same thing with a, if you decide to do an increase in twenty one, but the base is still the same. We we can't use this as a revenue generator. Sometime in my lifetime we had a massive reassessment here. I mean, was it in 2000? In 2000. Yeah. And that, I mean, assessments went from like $3,000 $3, to, yes. <laughs> yeah, to, 100, to fair market 5, as of 1998. So we could revise the slide just to, just to really hit it home that this is purely an example. Um, I can put assumed in, in bolds and things like that. So we can make a couple modifications, but I, I, 
I do think the but mathematical math example math does help people. But mathematically, it's correct. Yes. I mean, it's based maybe, on a reset of the millions. Examples. No, mathematically, it's correct if we went from 13 million to 26 million and yeah. we cut our millage in half. Yeah, it's not right. correct if we actually ended up at about. Just use it as a hypothetical right. example. If we end up at about 115% of our current True. assessment. Yeah. Then people mm -hmm. who got a 100% increase in their taxes or in, in their assessment mm -hmm. are going to have a larger increase in their taxes. And that's, um, it's just, it's all being reapportioned, to use a terrible word, um, um, among the, the folks in the township. So um, it, that, was, that, that was my only concern was okay. that, that, that particular slide. And, and there's magic to that number. On our median assessment was about 151,000. Right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, half of our homes in this township were at that number or higher or at that yes. number or lower. So, people are going to lock on to that example. I don't think they should. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, you else? Good. Thank you. Thank while, you. While, while, Great slide. Oh, Good job. While Amy is up there, can I skip ahead just to get... I, let me just let Dave has one more item on the first. Oh. Good. Thank you. I just wanted to mention... As you saw by my report earlier, this situation is evolving. We have set up a page on our website that's dedicated to the coronavirus. We're going to be put up, putting up links to both the Pennsylvania Department of Health and the Centers for, for Disease Prevention and Protection, uh, Control and Prevention. So um, we're not going to be able to keep up with the evolution of this on our website. I just don't think we have the staff to do that. However, the links will be there. If you want to take a look at our website, click the links, or just go direct to the state or to the, to the feds. That would be um, my suggestion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Berman. You have one more item? Well, we eventually have to get to the refunding of the 2014 GO bonds. And while Ms. Cuthbertson was up, I was just going to ask her, um, with regard to the ordinance for refunding the 2014 general obligation bond, which we're doing tonight, there are obviously, it's market upheaval right now, and it's going to be the recommendation of our financial advisors that we don't sell the bonds until, you know, there's more analysis and, and continued analysis as to whether to do the right thing. But that does not change whether or not we should act tonight. And authorize the ordinance. True. Right now, we are on the schedule to sell on March 19th. That is that is right now the plan. Um, our financial advisor with PFM, they are going to reach out to the underwriting community and see how they're reacting to what's going on in the market right now. His inclination is that most of the big underwriters that would be interested in our types of bonds may be sitting on the sidelines until things calm down. Um, but if that is his recommendation, you're correct. The ordinance that we passed tonight really has no bearing on time. It is an open-ended. We can do it whenever we want. The only thing we'd want to be cognizant of is the Moody's rating that will be uh, coming out next week and finalized. That's good for six months. So we're, we're good for six months without any additional action on the board's part. Great. Okay. And, and that assures people that even if we act tonight, people may say, oh my gosh, you're acting in the midst of this upheaval. And the fact is we're not. We're just preparing ourselves yes. to be able to act when things calm down or when we think best time to strike. Yes, and obviously rates for a bond issue are extremely, extremely favorable right now. But he would also like to get the biggest pool of buyers because that would also get the best prices too. So that's why he's he's leaning towards maybe uh, postponing a little bit. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Berman. Thank you, Amy. Appreciate your insights and your comments. The next item is the approval of minutes. Mr. Chairman, Mr. I'd like to make a motion to approve the regular meeting minutes of February 10th. 2020. Second. Motion made and seconded. Any concerns, questions, changes? Please call the roll. Mr. Melio? Yes. Mr. Oliva? Yes. Mr. McCluskey? Yeah. Yes. Mr. Siegel? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Mr. Quinn? Yes. Dr. Hart? Yes. Mr. Holmes? Yes. Mr. Wexler? Yes. Item seven is the approval of warrants. Mr. Holmes? Uh, Mr. President, move we approve warrant number three of 2020 totaling $3,216,100.88, comprising the general and sewer fund payroll for February 20th, 2020, in the amount of $669,504.77, the general and sewer fund payroll for March 5th, 2020, in the amount of $654,455.89, 
general fund disbursements number three of 2020 in the amount of one million two hundred sixty four thousand eight hundred forty two dollars and eighty nine cents sewer fund disbursements number three of 2020 in the amount of five hundred six thousand eight hundred thirty nine dollars and eighty nine cents community development block grant fund disbursement number three of 2020 in the amount of sixty eight thousand five hundred thirty five dollars and forty two cents capital projects fund disbursement number three of 2020 in the amount of thirty three thousand four hundred thirty four dollars and fifty nine cents and a credit card statement ending february 27 2020 in the amount of eighteen thousand four hundred eighty seven dollars and forty three cents second motion made and second any questions mr president these uh warrants have been uh, uh reviewed by our township auditor any questions that he had uh, he raised to the township staff and they were answered to his satisfaction he recommends these be approved as do i thank you please call the roll mr d'amelio i oh, stepped out of it oh i'm sorry mr oliva Yes. Mr. McCluskey. Yes. Mr. Siegel. Yes. Mr. Lewis. Yes. Mr. Quinn. Yes. Dr. Hart. Yes. Mr. Holmes. Yes. And Mr. Wexler. Yes. Item eight, second reading. Mr. Holmes. Uh, Mr. President, uh, I, I move we adopt the second reading of ordinance number P6 2020, uh, 2020, authorizing the incurrence of non-electoral debt by the township of Haverford to refund the township's general obligations bonds series of 2014 in an aggregate principal amount not to exceed $11 million. Second. Motion made and second. Any questions? I think Ms. Cuthbert's didn't cover it pretty well. Yeah, Ms. Um, uh, uh, indeed, our, our assistant Thank you very much. manager did. Thank you. We, uh, for folks who uh, did not pay attention at the previous meetings, um, this is an opportunity for us to refund bonds that have become callable uh, after six years now. Um, the anticipated savings on these bonds uh, uh, by refunding these bonds will be at least a million dollars and could be two million dollars over the remaining life of these bonds. We will not extend the useful life, the, uh, the average maturity of these bonds. We will not be replacing the assets that they already uh, secure. Um, this is a very sound uh, financial move uh, by the township, and uh, I recommend that we adopt it. Thank you. Please call the roll. Mr. D'Amelio. Yes. Mr. Oliva. Yes. Mr. McCluskey. Yes. Mr. Siegel. Yes. Mr. Lewis. Yes. Mr. Quinn. Yes. Dr. Hart. Yes. Mr. Holmes. Yes. And Mr. Wexler. Yes. Item nine, ordinance P7-2020. Mr. President. Mr. Oliva. I'd like to make a motion to adopt a second reading of ordinance number P7-2020, authorizing traffic, traffic restrictions on the following highways, special purpose, Parking zones rescind in front of 652 Dayton Road and in front of 615 Furlong Avenue and to establish on Brookview Lane at the front entrance of 562 Strathmore Road and on Malvern Road across from 643 Malvern Road. Second. Motion made and second. Any questions? Please call the roll. Mr. D'Amelio. Yes. Mr. Oliva. Yes. Mr. McCluskey. Yes. Mr. Siegel. Yes. Mr. Lewis. Yes. Mr. Quinn. Yes. Dr. Hart. Yes. Mr. Holmes. Yes. Mr. Wexler. Yes. Item 10, ordinance B8-2020. Mr. President. Mr. Oliva. I'd like to make a motion to adopt the second reading of ordinance number P8-2020 that the township authorizes a two-year renewal lease agreement with Chef and Sons, LLC, DBA, Have a Burger, Essington, PA, for a certain portion of the township grounds located at 1018 Darby Road. Second. Sk sk skating. Motion made and seconded. Very enthusiastically. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why. Is that Connor? Any questions on this, please? <laughs> this is a second reading. You can tell he's a rookie. He's uh... Way to go, Connor. <laughs> yeah. Please call the roll. Mr. D'Amelio. Yes. Mr. Oliva. Yes. Mr. McCluskey. Yes. Mr. Siegel. Yes. Mr. Lewis. Yes. Mr. Quinn? Yes. Dr. Hart? Yes. Mr. Holmes? Yes. Mr. Wexler? Yes. Item 11. Mr. Chairman, um, again, this is in honor of Bruce Blaze. Uh, motion to adopt the second reading of ordinance number P9-2020 to provide for a new chapter 184 to be known as Neighborhood Blight Reclamation and Revitalization, providing for certain 
protections and safeguards in order to address de deteriorated properties, public nuisances, and properties in serious violation of state law and or, and or municipal codes and in respect thereto providing provisions for definitions, actions, assist attachment, asset attachment, duties of out-of-state owners of property, duties of association and trust owners, municipal permit denials, conflict with other laws, relief from inherited property, statutory construction, implementation, repealers, severability, and immediate effectiveness. Second. <laughs> I just want to be as enthusiastic as possible. I again want to thank the property committee and Dan Siegel for working on this. Uh, yeah, it was a great job doing this. A lot of work. Please call it. Mr. D'Amelio. Yes. Mr. Oliva. Yes. Mr. McCluskey. Yes. Mr. Siegel. Yes. Mr. Lewis. Yes. Mr. Quinn. Yes. Dr. Hart. Yes. Mr. Holmes. Yes. Mr. Waxley. Yes. Item 12 is listed as a, let's, um, and deal this with a work session? Yeah, yeah let's, let's, yeah, let's I go yes, to the work that session. That's yeah. item 13, ordinance P12-2020. Traffic first reading, uh, Sarah? Oh, I, I mean, I'll do it. Uh, Mr. President, I'd like to make a motion to adopt the first reading of ordinance number P-12-2020, authorizing traffic restrictions on the following highway. On Sarah Avenue, north at the intersection of Maryland Avenue, making this a three-way stop, and special pur purpose parking uh, in front of 100 East Park Road. Second. Second. Ah, there we go. Connor? <laughs> Let me down, man. <laughs> Any questions? Please call the roll. Mr. D'Amelio. Yes. Mr. Oliva. Yes. Mr. McCluskey. Yes. Mr. Siegel. Yes. Mr. Lewis. Yes. Mr. Quinn. Yes. Dr. Hart. Yes. Mr. Holmes. Yes. Mr. Wexler. Yes. Item 14, housekeeping item for the transfer of funds. Mr. President. Mr. Holmes. Mr. President, I move that we adopt resolution number 2174 of 2020, authorizing the transfer of, 2019, of 2019 funds. Second. Motion made second. Anyone need an explanation? We have um, expenditure uh, increases from for administration, auxiliary function, parks and rec, um, general fund revenue increases, um, and then general fund expenditure decreases. And this just represents the um, transfer of funds from 19 to the 20 budget. Anything I got wrong there, Ms. Cuthbertson? <laughs> this is all pertaining to the 19 budget. It reconciles those departments that went over and how we funded them through additional revenues or decreases in other departments. So it, it's not really carry over to 20. This is all pertaining to 19. Oh, okay, it's just a restatement of 19. Please call the roll. Mr. D'Amelio. Yes. Mr. Oliva. Yes. Mr. McCluskey. Yes. Mr. Siegel. Yes. Mr. Lewis. Yes. Mr. Quinn. Yes. Dr. Hart. Yes. Mr. Holmes. Yes. And Mr. Wexler. Yes. Item 15 is an appointment. Mr. President. Mr. Siegel. Motion to appoint Joseph Rudolph Esquire as the, as the township's heart and lung hearing officer. Second. Made in second by Mr. Oliva. Am I missing something? What, what, what is this? I'll <laughs> you. All right, if I answer. Sure. So uh, from time to time, we'll have a occasion. I don't want to get into anybody's names or anything because I don't want to you know to disclose any any personal information but there might be a question that comes up with respect to a um, disability uh, whether that whether that disability belongs in the workers compensation disability whether it belongs on the uh, heart and lung disability or whether in fact maybe there's not a disability at all and there becomes a, a, a need for a hearing uh, on that uh, on that matter uh, we're at a we're at a juncture at that at this point right now so this would be a one one shot hearing that mr. Rudolph sits as the hearing officer to hear the, um, the, the, the dispute um, and, uh, you know, the evidence that's presented by the, the um, I guess you would call him the appellant's lawyer as, as well as the township lawyer. So he's representing the township? Right? He's not representing the township. He's representing the hearing board. So the hearing, hearing board. He's, he's, he is the hearing board. He's the hearing, he's the hearing officer. For the township? He's, no, he's not for no, the township. He's, he's an independent. He, He's like the referee. Why, why, okay, why again? 
Are we doing this? Heart and lung. Because when you have somebody that when is claiming heart and lung benefits or some other type of benefits similar to that, but in this case, it's a heart and lung benefit. And the question becomes whether it should be a heart and lung benefit or whether it's a total disability, which then may become a worker's compensation liability, or if there's any disability at all, the question arises. So somebody has to decide what is right. <laughs> it wouldn't be the town. It wouldn't be the so, so what happened in the past? In the past, you can you can do it a couple of different ways. We've done it this way before, where we've had officers. You can also appoint members of the board to do it as well. This board? Yes. Mm -hmm. Could you just explain who it applies to, who gets heart and lung benefits? Police officers. Right. Okay. So who makes this, you made this recommendation to this attorney? I did, yes. You did, okay. Yes. There, there's a number of folks, there, there's, there's, there, there are individuals that do it as independents uh, that you, you have to get somebody that's accepted by both sides and no, Mr. I get Rudolph okay. does it a lot for both sides. Never saw it before. No. Sorry. All right. Okay. Any other questions? Please call the roll. Mr. D'Amelio. Yes. Mr. Oliva. Yes. Mr. McCluskey. Yes. Mr. Siegel. Yes. Mr. Lewis. Yes. Mr. Quinn. Yes. Dr. Hart. Yes. Mr. Holmes. Um, I need to ex abstain. I have a, of what? I know Mr. Rudolph and I was his partner for a while. I did not know about this application, so it, I played no role in its evaluation or its consideration or anything, and just want to make very clear that I'm abstaining. Yes, for me. That's fine. Thank you. Item 16 is vehicle purchases. Mr. President. Mr. Oliva. I'd like to make a motion to, to authorize the purchase of one 2020 Chevy Bolt electric vehicle for the Recreation Department in the amount of $31,700 under CoStar's contract 26054. Bolt and, <clears throat> and one 2020 Ford Explorer hybrid for the police department in the amount of $47,800 under Coastang's, uh, under CoStar's contract, 26053 uh, from Whitmore, Whitmore Auto Group, 1001 East Main Street, Mount Joy, PA, submitting the lowest responsible quotes. Second. Motion made and seconded. Any questions on these purchases? Glad to see we're getting an all electric vehicle. That's great. Please call the roll. Mr. D'Amelio? Yes. Mr. Oliva? Yes. Mr. McCluskey? Yes. Mr. Siegel? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Mr. Quinn? Yes. Dr. Hart? Yes. Mr. Holmes? Yes. And Mr. Wexler? Yes. Item 17. Mr. President? Mr. Oliva. Uh, motion to authorize the purchase of Target signs, uh, info board, and tee pads? Is that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, for the Howard Township Disc Golf Park, from Disc Golf Park, Quaker Town, PA, in the amount of $16,175. Second. Motion made and second. Would you like to explain that? Mr. Yeah, I, what is this? Yeah, what is uh, this? This is a, <laughs> this is an, well, I, why don't you do that, Brian? Um, we are planning on putting a disc golf course up at Haverford Reserve. Um, ever since Haverford Reserve opened, we've had a lot of different constituents that come up with different projects they would like to see. This one came up early, disc golf, and it's continued to come up over the last eight, 10 years that we've owned it. In the, in the fall brochure, we put out a note to residents that were interested in this to come to a meeting. Um, and we had about 40 or 50 residents respond and about 25 or 30 showed up at a meeting enthusiastically supporting a disc golf course at Haverford Reserve. The course would be positioned uh, in the open space behind the creck and it would, there would be very little need to be done as far as you know, trimming some trail work and uh, just trimming some trees. The uh, project, as we've defined it, would involve a lot of uh, constituents' help, volunteer work, a lot like the dog park and some of the other projects we've done. And um, the, the, we're planning on having another meeting to develop a friends group that's gonna be a stewardship there. So with the two reasons we propose this. One is we feel like there's a lot of programming options that we can do with it for some of our venture programs that we run out of the crack, also possibly tournaments, but then just adults, we're providing opportunities for adults to get out into nature and do something that they've told us they would like to see. So we're proposing that. So this, this is in your budget? This, this is 16. in the capital budget. 
It's in the capital budget. When was this planned? Well, we've been talking about this for a while, but it, you we, guys have. But this is first, um, we're hearing about it. But let me ask you another question. Behind the recreation, uh, you know where the uh, Freedom Playground is. Is it going behind that? No, it's behind like the crack, like going towards like Darby Road area yeah, it's, it's actually going up into the meadow like it, yeah so freedom playground is on the other side of the complex so it would be on the other side of park view drive you're, you're on the other side of the road. other side of park to the drive wood. into, the, into wood. the wood so you're going into the wood yeah we're going towards into the, the wood river. yes right so you, there's no interference with any any programs no. you already no. have right? no. no and it and we've talked to the groups that have both communities that have had it and to the con people that are use it it flows very well with trails and people just walking the trails and walking their dogs and running the trails. It, it, it should coexist very nicely. Uh, I think it's I think it's admirable that we're putting some of these programs and we, we've probably one of the leading municipalities with pickleball courts in this region as well. So mm -hmm. it's uh it's senior citizens and the younger people and trying to track some of the older people back into the other stuff as right. well. And it's an idea Pretty that's cool. constituent generated. People yep. came to us and asked us about the possibilities. And we had said, well, you know, down the road, we'll look at it when we have some capital funding. I, I think we're progressive. Look what we did with the state skate park for the yeah. younger this people. This is this is just a continuation of the same stuff. Mm -hmm. the more they can do, the more they can do without getting in trouble, the more I'm for it. Also, I'd like to add that it's recommended by our uh, Parks and Parks Rec Board. The, the Park and Rec Board is recommending we do this. Any other questions? Please call the roll. Mr. D'Amelio. Yes. Mr. Oliva. Yes. Mr. McCluskey. Yes. Mr. Siegel. Yes. Mr. Lewis. Yes. Mr. Quinn. Yes. Dr. Hart. Yes. Mr. Holmes. Yes. Mr. Wexler. Yes. Item 18 is the two senior citizen advisory board members. I actually have a person, but he hasn't given me permission to release his name until he just got back from Florida. So I'll catch him tomorrow. I have fifth and ward bill. Hmm? I have the fifth ward. Okay, if you can give us the name. I nominate Victor Barsky. Victor Barsky, okay. Victor's doing double duty. He's also serving on the EAC and done a great job, so we appreciate him willing, willing to step forward in another capacity. So thank you, Victor. And the continuation, the next item is a continuation of Citizens Forum. Is there any member of the public that would like to address the board on any item that, and it does not have to be an agenda item? So please come up, Mr. Scrolls. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, a couple of things. One of the things I've heard uh, from time to time about parking at the library is that if there was such uh, a need for parking, why do we have the highest circulation uh, in the county? Uh, and I think we got to look at that in terms of what the population of Haverford Township is versus the other libraries. Uh, and I have something I can... Uh, I will send to you because I just got it this, after, this evening. I've been away, uh, and I just want to make sure it, it's, uh, it's, it's accurate. But when you look at it from a per capita point of view, as much as I'd love to be here and say we do have the highest per capita, we don't. Uh, and there's others that uh, do have higher per capita uh, circulation as well as membership. So I do want to put that on the table uh, so we don't get off the parking issue by saying, well, you have so many people, then why do you need more parking, uh, and I will also, sh uh, with that list, also show you uh, the libraries in Delaware County uh, that have undergone renovations, expansions, and new buildings since 1999. <clears throat> uh, having said that, uh, I understand the difficulty this commissioners have. There is no easy answer on this thing, okay? so. Uh, I don't stand up here to complain or anything like that. I think it's difficult. Uh, I, I think there's five possible alternatives we're looking at. Uh, one is utilizing the Brookline School as is with renovations, keeping the Brookline School but turning it into a library. That has a bunch of issues with it, and most notably parking. Uh, two, uh, putting a new library where Brookline currently is, in other words, demolishing it, uh, that we know has uh, money issues. Uh, the third is to build a new building at Brookline for less money, but that has playing field issues. The other one is continue with the renovations, 
at the current library, and we know that has parking issues with it. And the other alternative, I'd say, is renovations at the current library and solve the par parking issue uh, by buying additional properties uh, around there. Uh, so I understand uh, the issue. I would recommend, and my frustration is, I don't think we're talking to each other simultaneously here and we get information uh, on an iterative basis, which I think has delayed the process. And I would recommend uh, Commissioner Wexler, if, if he could appoint a committee, and I've, I know some might be out of place saying this, uh, but to have the uh, township manager, Dave Berman, myself as president of the library, uh, I'd like to have Scott Lowe, who's an expert in construction. He goes around the country testifying. He's paid to testify. We have a skill set on the library and, and dealing with the, either the library committee or the real estate committee, and we meet. And I think if we sat down for four sessions, we could come up with an answer or at least lay out all the pros and cons with the money attached that we can look at, that you can look at, because it's your decision, and make a decision. Uh, it's gone on too long. It's more than two years. Uh, I turn 75 next uh, month. I started at this. I was a young man. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Wexler, you praised that young children coming up here. Can't a little praise for an old man, please? Uh, <laughs> but it's, it's, it, it really is time to get on with it. But I think if we sit down and work together, it can be resolved. And I understand it's a difficult decision. Uh, but I don't look at it, I, I look at it as replacing a defunct, a defunct educational facility with a brand new educational facility. A library is an educational facility, open to all. It's not just a, a, a school, and I'm not diminishing schools. Uh, but I think for this township to have a spanking new library will speak tons for this library and for this township for its viability. Virtually every other township in this county has either expanded, built new, or renovated. And we've been here twiddling our thumbs and uh, working hard at it. Well, let, go ahead and let Mr. Hill then can I speak? comment. Yeah. Yes, you can, I, but let I me I retract finish. that statement. Yeah, I wish you would. I, I would retract that statement. Because that was a little I, bit of an insult. I said that this is a difficult issue. Okay. But we got to make it, we got because the only thing that's happened is we've lost a state grant. We spent over half a million dollars. And the cost of living is going up. And the cost of construction. So we just got to get on. And some people are going to be annoyed. And maybe it's going to be me. Or maybe it's going to be people elsewhere. But... That's where we're at, I think. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Commissioner D'Amelio, now you can speak. Yeah, I, I, you know, I don't think we're twiddling our thumbs. So I mean, we're talking about spending maybe 25 to $30 million of taxpayer money. We have a building that we're trying to decide. These things are not easy. You just can't spend money without doing your due diligence, and that's what we're doing. We are working together with you. This board has said we're going to do something. We're not going to do nothing. We are going to do something. But you know what? It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of time. A lot of research. We're still looking at things. It's we want to get there, and we hope to do this in April. That's our goal. Okay. To, to make a decision in April. So we're not twiddling our thumbs. That's just something that the taxpayers expect from us, from, and even from what you guys expect from us to look at every option. The, look at what we did with Brookline today. We tabled it. We we still have to look at that. There are I other understand. things that may be coming up that we can't talk about now. I retract okay. my statement. It was an unwise statement, and I don't I don't. Oh, I know you're going to okay. You're, you're, you're not going to get into dialogue. I get it. Your time's up, and okay. he's just responding to your comment. Okay. That's thank all. Thank you. So thank you very much okay. for, thank you. for doing it. Is there any other member of the public? Mr. Pugliese. Who's an easy answer? Me? <laughs> Good evening, uh, Chris Connell, 500 block Kenmore Road. And I know all you guys are up here thinking he's going to say something about the library. <laughs> uh, wrong. So everybody owes me an apology. <laughs> um, actually, uh, I've owned different businesses uh, for different years. Uh, one was with my father-in-law, which was a, a local tappy. And that place was where you, uh, the neighborhood people for generations could go 
um, and amuse themselves, socialize, and smoke, and smoke, and smoke. And the state came in, as you know, a few years ago, and said, you know what? Restaurants and uh, establishments that uh, serve food, no more smoking, except for like, if it's less than 10%. The gavel came down, boom, and there was no more smoke. And everybody before that was like, oh my gosh, this is going to be terrible. How are we going to deal with this? But the thing is that they did it, and was there time to react to it? Well, hopefully not, but because nothing has changed. People don't smoke. People are healthier for it. I feel like I, I wish I could be healthier for it, but all that second, I haven't smoked in, in 40 years, but all that secondhand smoke, I'm sure, is playing havoc with me now. So my point is, is that I support Mr. Poglianisi for the bags because the gavel should come down, boom, and just say, it's done, it's done. We need to do it, and it's not going to hurt anybody else because once it is done, you're never going to know, you know, the, the difference anyway. So I am support for you for that ordinance, and uh, you can make a cover for a book, even from the library, better with a paper bag That's than you can with a plastic, plastic bag. bag yeah. <laughs> so, we do that all the time. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Remember that? So, sure. Remember that. Yeah. <laughs> Sister only let me do that. Nobody ever bought book covers. They made them. Peter? Peter Pulianisi, 654 Lawson Avenue. I wanted to thank the board, township staff for uh, advancing the purchase of the electric vehicle that they approved and the hybrid police vehicle. Um, this year is the 50th anniversary of the original Earth Day. Um, I, I was really moved by the two young ladies who spoke here today that remind me, unfortunately, that our generation has not done a good enough job of stewardship of the planet. Um, and I, I wanted to remind everybody that the purchases that were made today, the vehicles, represent the lower cost of ownership of the lifetime of those vehicles of all the alternatives that are out there. So we are saving the township money uh, by making these kinds of purchases. I would encourage you to use every dollar that you spend uh, similarly wisely um, to further um, our reduction of our carbon footprint. And you guys are an example for, I think, a lot of municipalities in the area. We get a lot of positive comments about, wow, look at what Haverford is doing. Uh, but more importantly, I think you're a model for the community, which also needs to do everything that it can do when it spends money for a car, when it pays its power bill, really new, needs to follow this example um, and do everything that you can do today. Uh, you, you all have EAC as an advisor, a prod. Um, the community has a resource as well. So there is a, a group of volunteers that could advise people uh, on buying renewable power. They can email haveswitch at gmail.com and get advice from their neighbors. How did I do it? How can I do it? Uh, we also have a, um, we are going into the second year of a group solar purchasing program, Solarize, um, and anyone who is interested in putting solar on their house can email, uh, what is it, SolarizeDelco at gmail.com. Uh, and I think we had nine installations uh, in uh, 2019 through this program, and we're hoping to at least double that in 2020. So thank you for all you're doing, and thank everybody you. out there, 
get with the program. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Pete. Thank you, Pete. And thank, thank the rest of the members of the EAC. Anyone else want to address the board? <coughs> there being none, that closes the continuation of the citizens forum. New business. Any member have any new business? Mr. President. Mr. Holmes. Mr. President, I'd like us at the April work session to talk about um, the formation of an ad hoc committee um, to address an issue that came up in 2019. A number of people raised it to us during Citizens Forum, and that's about um, the paucity of preschool and after school care for children in the township. I do not believe that we as a township necessarily have to own or are responsible for that issue. But as leaders, I think we're able to get, um, to put people together and get as much information as we can about it. And perhaps I, I have in mind a, a joint committee made up of, of citizen volunteers who then advise us and the school district um, as to what other townships are doing. Um, with regard to the desperate need for pre and after school care uh, for young children. And uh, I think it's, um, we don't necessarily have to make a standing committee that um, exists forever. I don't think we have to amend our charter, but I'd like to think that we'd be able to create an ad hoc committee, um, maybe charge that committee with um, uh, in several months to come back to us with some data about what other um, areas have done, whether school districts and townships have worked together to help solve that process, whether we simply as um, folks who have access to the, um, to the business community are able to um, attract uh, businesses that, that do this for profit or whether there's nonprofit alternatives. Um, but something we've been talking about quietly and I'd, I'd like us to take it under serious consideration at the, at the April work session. Commissioner Holmes, I, I agree with you totally. <clears throat> yeah, I'd like to be part of that committee. So would I. If, uh, Great. if it does come up. Is there yeah, anyone opposed to such a concept? There being none, I'll ask Mr. Berman if, he, if in your dealings, obviously you can be working with the school district over the next couple of weeks extensively, that if I, I think it would be important that we'd have at least some participation from the district to be part of that ad hoc committee as well. Absolutely. Well, yeah. yeah, and it may be whether it's whether it's the school district and we are simply ultimately put together and we get information from this committee. I mean, this committee might start out not as school district and and uh, and township people, but just um, parents and folks who right. I mean, experience. the ad hoc committee on on the Heifer Reserve with not commissioners; it was citizens. So, right. Uh, it was run by Jan Marie. It was a citizen. It was. She was the chairperson, so something like that. But at least that they would have an expert from both this body as well as the school district for questions, sure. answers, facility, that type of that type of stuff. So we will discuss that next month at the work session. We'll please add that to the agenda. Any other new business? Thank you, Mr. President. If there's not, I have one item. I will read this and then ask somebody to make the motion. This is a housekeeping item. It's a resolution that Hafford Township hereby received the Multimodal Transportation Fund Grant in the amount of $250,000 from the Commonwealth Financing Authority to be used for streetscape and pedestrian improvements along the west side of Darby Road from West Benedict Avenue to Belmead Avenue. And be it further resolved that the Board of Commissioners hereby designates David R. Berman, Township Manager, and Amy M. Cuthbertson, Assistant Township Manager, as the officials to execute all documents and agreements between the Township and the Commonwealth Financing Authority to facilitate and assist in obtaining the requested grant resolved this ninth day of March. I'd ask for a motion on that. Make a motion. Motion made. There's a second. 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 Britt, my rationale in the discussion for this is we applied for that grant during Mr. Gentili's time frame, and now when we're trying to collect the money, we have to update the paperwork, put Mr. Berman's name on there. So it's simply a housekeeping thing so we can collect our funds. Great. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you very much. Other business, Mr. D'Amelio. Yeah, I just want to thank again, uh, Mr. Poclanese and EAC for his hard work on this bag ordinance. I think it's critical that we take the lead again and show our community, and especially with the, I guess the young ladies had to go for school, uh, that we are serious about continuing improving the carbon footprint in our world, let alone this little world here. Um, 
Chief Viola, uh, there was an incident the other night. Uh, if you can just inform the board and the public, I know there's a, a lot of things you cannot say, but uh, of course, you know, my phone was blowing up as well as yours at that hour. Mine, mine too. Yeah, two so o'clock you, in the morning. You, you called me at three o'clock in the morning and I was up <laughs> to take your phone call. So I was shocked that you know, <laughs> I thought you'd be snoring. But <laughs> no, I wasn't. Um, Why'd you we, call? It, it came in as a home invasion in the 1300 block of Virginia Avenue when in fact it was a robbery, uh, when uh, we did an investigation, and obviously I can't get into too much detail, uh, we found that there, we've had activity in that house, police activity in that house that we are aware of, and uh, it is our belief and through our investigation that the person who got into the house with a kid was given to him by a girlfriend, uh, robbed the homeowner of a substantial amount of cash. It is under investigation, there's absolutely no danger to the neighborhood, or anyone else, it is under investigation. We expect to make an arrest on it soon. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Brian, where are we with upgrading the parks for the capital project? I mean, what what's the schedule? Do you have it? I don't have it with me, but I can definitely provide it. We're on schedule. We're finishing veterans. Equipment in. Yeah, okay. If you can get me a, a copy of that. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. You can yeah. give us an update. Okay. All right, with the parks and the trails. Okay, thanks. That's it. Thank you. Mr. Levin. All right, uh, first of all, um, I'd like to thank um, John Viola and, uh, and uh, Jim McCanns, as well as our township manager, for keeping us updated and protected from this. Uh, from the uh, coronavirus, um, so thank you guys. I know you guys. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes to prepare for this, um, and uh, a lot of um, a lot of hard work and planning goes into something like this, um, and and the contingencies to which which uh, we, we are prepared for. But these guys have really been working hard to to do this. So my hats off to these guys. Um, I'd also like to, uh, on the agenda was the uh, full electric vehicle um, that is gonna be in our parks and rec department. So I, you know, we've been pushing very hard for this and, and finally um, they are making vehicles that, are, that, that can handle this. Um, and so we're, we're beginning to use them. So um, this, is, uh, this is good for the environment and, uh, and it shows that we are on the, on the leading edge of this. So uh, thank, thank you guys for this. Uh, and uh, that's all I have. Thank you. So before you move on, I just want to have one more time. You know, I, I know February was uh, Black History Month and we're in March, but I did want to bring something up because Catherine Johnson died on her own one. She was a mathematician at um, NASA. Sorry, my, my um, microphone was off. It, you know, I saw the movie Hidden Figures, and I never knew that so many talented women worked that hard without computers back then. She wielded a little more than a pencil and a slide roller and was one of the finest math, math mechanical minds in the country. She died at 101 at a retiring home in Newport News, Virginia. She calculated the precise trajectories that would let Apollo 11 land on the moon and in 1969, and after Neil Armstrong's history-making moonwalk, let it return to Earth. That was an amazing woman, and I think that this country. Sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. You gonna say something? No, I hit. Oh. Um, anyway, just want to, you know, pass that on and an honor. Thank you. Thank you. Here. Mr. McCluskey, you're up next. Uh, yeah, just briefly, I, I. As everyone knows, today was a beautiful day out. Uh, everybody's outside on their lawns when I was coming over here, gathering, neighbors seeing each other for the first time in a couple of months after the winter. Kids are out on bikes, people are crossing streets. Um, I'd ask everybody to just try to slow down. I'm sure we'll all be getting calls shortly about people going through uh, side streets and residential streets. 
And I, again, I've said this a couple times now, but if, even if you don't think you're speeding, I assure you that the people standing on the lawn as you drive by think you're speeding. So if you could just slow down a little bit going through residential streets. And then just again, not to reiterate on the library, um, however you want to describe it, whatever we've been doing for the last year and a half, we're putting in um, efforts to gather information. It, it's now time to, to make a decision and it's incumbent us to make a decision. So I look forward to doing that next month. Thank you. Mr. Siegel. Thank you. First, uh, for voters who vote or have voted historically at 4-4, the 4th Ward, 4th Precinct, which has voted uh, at St. George's Church, first in a garage and then in, in the uh, main entrance, that polling place has been moved and effective immediately, voters who had voted at St. George's Church will now vote at the rec center uh, and at the, where we have another polling place. I want to thank the township manager, Mr. Barrett, for helping facilitate that. Uh, it's the new voting machines have made it impossible for them to hold the voting anymore at St. George's. So this decision done quickly, efficiently. Voters can go online and verify their locations. There's already been a mailing to all voters in 4-4 uh, advising them of this. Um, and we'll also make sure that anyone that there'll be signs at the church so people know those who didn't see the signs or the notices that they go to the rec center to vote. It'll be adjacent to the current polling place for 4-1 on the first floor. Uh, so thank you for your help in getting that done. A uh, couple other things. Uh, it is pothole season, and for those who are driving on state roads, which it means any road where you find a pothole, those are not the township's responsibility, and you do have to contact PennDOT. They do at times respond. Uh, they finally patched areas of Lawrence Road that had uh, sort of turned into the it looked like the demilitarized zone from Vietnam recently. So they do respond. It can be a little slow, but please, you have to notify PennDOT. The township <coughs> can't take any actions on those roads. In addition, um, the new traffic adaptive uh, system is in. It is still adjusting. Uh, most of it works very nicely. Uh, but Lawrence Road, Westchester Pike, the Blue Route still has significant, I think, adjustments today. The Blue Route was backed up uh, probably a quarter mile onto the Blue Route to get off going southbound um, because of construction and because of the lights. So it'll get there, but you have to be patient uh, as the system sort of learns. Uh, and, and finally, sort of a personal note, I did finally, after a three plus month hiatus for reasons that I explained in the newsletter, uh, bring back my newsletter and it'll be coming back on a regular basis and I thank those who uh, for your comments about it. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Mr. Holmes. Uh, Mr. President, thank you. Um, I, I've been uncharacteristically quiet tonight about the library. The issue is extremely complicated, and while I appreciate my colleagues talking about the time to move is now and to talk in April, um, I'll consider a vote in April if we have real things in front of us. There's stuff the township's evaluating right now and considering what it could do for the library, but um, this has taken the time it has taken for a lot of reasons, and I'm, it doesn't distill down simply to we've taken too much time or, you know, it's because it, it, we're only going to make this decision once and we're only going to build a new library or renovate the library or do something, we're only gonna undertake that project once and I'm gonna make sure that it is that it is done correctly. No matter where we do it and what we do, it's going to be expensive. So it's gonna to need to be, you know, we have to view it as a very important investment of our township assets, but we also need the investment of the library to commit to its fundraising and commit to working with the township to make this happen. So. Um, I do look forward to, um, to making decisions, but I remind our board that we need to make informed decisions, and if that takes more time, we just have to handle the political fallout that comes from decisions that take a long time because we have to, we have to at least listen to 
to consider a lot of constituencies during these during these discussions. So um, that's uh, I look forward to next month's meeting, but more important, I look forward in the future for us resolving the library issues. And I can assure you, I'll be a, a, an agent of change and of, and of a positive movement in that. I'm just um, still evaluating all the all the different options that are out there, and uh, do look forward to us all coming uh, to a landing on that. So that's all I have, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Thank you, Mr. President. I just want to remind our residents that the Billboard case, um, as you may recall, there are four billboards being proposed in Hereford Township by Bartkowski Investment Group, uh, two along Westchester Pike and two along Lancaster Avenue in the fifth ward. And the other two are one is in the uh, first and the second ward. Um, the case is being continued to April 2nd and 3rd in the Delaware County Court of Common Pleas before Judge Spike Angelos in courtroom 10 at nine o'clock uh, both days. I urge our residents to make every effort to be there, uh, to show presence, to show our resolve as a, as a community in opposition to this proposal, which will threaten uh, our quality of life, our, our property values, um, health and safety and, and welfare of the community. So I uh, urge you to come and be part of it. Um, I wanna compliment our solicitor uh, Jim Byrne, who has represented uh, this township uh, in this matter for almost 10 years now, uh, and we still don't have the billboards. So uh, he has done an outstanding job in representing uh, all of us as residents, and he's been uh, also adding value as our own uh, solic solicitor from the Zoning Hearing Board, as well as the solicitor from Lower Marion Township. So we have a first-class legal team uh, fighting this at every turn, and we'll continue to do so. So I want to thank Jim, and again, urge our residents to be there uh, in attendance. I'll be there, as, as will Commissioner Oliva, and I'm sure uh, Commissioner D'Amelio. Uh, I mean, um, uh, so if you can be there, please uh, please plan to join us, and um, we'll keep this fight going and, until, until every last breath. So thank you. So thank I, you, Mr. Lewis. Mr. Quinn. And I, too, would like to thank Jim Byrne for all his hard, hard work. I... Uh, I've been co coming to these things since you began that. So, so um, but I also want, 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 wanted to ask uh, one quick thing about, because I got three calls today, one right before I came in here, um, about a lot have been, been in, a lot have put, put out leaves and they've been getting complaints that they, um, that they won't uh, collect leaves. So if they want to know what to do. I said, just put them in, in uh, the trash. That's correct. Uh, yeah, so that's all I said. So I just want, or I just wanted to make make sure I was right on that. So you you are correct. All right, good. All right, that's all I have. Thank you, Dr. Hart. Yes, uh, just a couple things. Uh, Commissioner Quinn and I are planning, hopefully, to have a joint um, Ward Seven and Eight me, uh, t Ward meeting sometime in the next month. We're trying to come up with a date, um, and, but we'll both put something out on. Uh, emails and Facebook, um, and then also just about the coronavirus. Um, I don't pretend to be an infectious disease expert, but compared to everybody else up here, I suppose I am. Uh, I what, think, what's you know, that say? It's <laughs> a minimum standard. Um, you know, I think people should pay attention somewhere between paying, being totally inattentive and panicking is probably the right approach. Um, there are no confirmed cases in this area. I think once we start doing testing, there's a good likelihood that we're going to find cases in Pennsylvania. That doesn't mean we're going to have an epidemic. Um, I applaud um, Mr. Berman, uh, Chief Viola, Mr. McCanns. They have a plan in case things become, um, we reach that stage, but you know, hopefully that's not going to happen. 80% of people who, at, at least by current statistics who get the infection are either asymptomatic or have a very mild infection. But everybody needs to pay attention because for those other 20%, other, if people don't take the precautions, the hand washing, avoiding um, handshaking, the things we've been hearing again and again, you put at risk the other 20% of the population um, who people with chronic diseases, um, older people, including myself, um, so, you know, let's take precautions, 
but not panic. Um, we don't, uh, Costco's sold out of, of everything. I don't think we need to go to those extremes, but just pay attention. That's all I have. Thank you. I just have a several, two, th two or three things. I'd like to thank Ann and Lauren, the two young women that were here. Uh, Mr. Goldsmith from the library alluded to the, our youth and our age. And so I thank Mr. Goldsmith. We'll give you your formal thank you for your age. Uh, but it was great to see the young people there. Uh, when you talk about age, uh, a couple weeks ago, or a week or two ago, Township lost one of our older residents, Mr. John Stretch, uh, owner of the Stretch Funeral Home, but pretty much an icon in this township uh, to all the people, especially in the fire services. I'd like to thank all the fire companies that showed up and supported his funeral and his tribute, his life tribute to a great life. He was uh, just a phenomenal asset to his parish, St. Dennis, as well as the township. Uh, never shy about voicing his opinion to anyone, uh, but a mainstay, an icon in Haverford Township that has passed on. And I just want to recognize his service uh, to the township for the last 60, 70, 80 years that he was here. Um, his generosity uh, did not go unnoticed, but it's just and a lot of generosity that he never took or won a credit for that went on behind the scenes to a lot of different organizations in this township. So I think I just wanted to, to pay tribute to him as well as pay tribute to our police department and fire departments that participated in his life celebration. And my ward meeting will be March 26th at, at the Quarterly Hilltop Civic Association held at the Bonaire Fire Department that night. And I'm told, Chief Iola, you have? You, you, you said what I wanted to say, but okay. Mr. Stretch, oh, thank you. That. I didn't mean to. Okay, uh, that's it. Is there a motion for adjournment? So moved. We're adjourned. Thank you.